Hello, 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 and welcome back, everybody. It's Corey Poirier with the uh, day two. I was going to say the latest edition, but day two of the Blue Talks Flip Your Script virtual event. And uh, you'll notice uh, my co-host, Elise, is uh, conspicuous by her absence. Uh, she had uh, messaged me to ask me if she could jump on just a few minutes late. So uh, she will be joining us fairly soon. And um, we have a guest that's supposed to be joining us. I sent them a message. So we'll see if they are able to join us today. And otherwise, I'm going to jump into some stuff anyway. Uh, so we'll see what happens. We do have a, a great lineup today as well. Um, we have uh, Teresa Greco coming up in about 45 minutes and Sylvia Varange coming up in an hour and a half. Uh, and like I said, if, uh, if our other guests can't make it, we'll see what we can do to reschedule them. But uh, yeah, other than that, how is everybody's day going? Hope everybody's having a fantastic Tuesday. Uh, it's funny, this is one of those weeks where even just keeping track of the days is, is a challenge. So um it's uh, it's going fantastic for me, and I'm super stoked to be back here as well. So, yay. Uh, so it's super exciting to be here. And what I wanted to um, talk about today is I wanted to, first of all, dive in and let everybody know. I always get asked what I'm reading these days, so I thought I would uh, tell you what I've been reading before we jump into things. Uh, feel free, of course, to post your questions about and around mindset. That's usually what we like to focus on uh, for this week-long event and also introduce you to some fantastic Blue Talk speakers. So in terms of what am I reading right now, this is one of the books that I've been reading uh, most recently. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Wattles. And yesterday I shared that I was reading, uh, also reading the Mindset Code by uh, Cappy Pidwell. And if you're a member of our Influencer Vault, you can go over to the Influencer Vault and check out our most recent interview with Cappy Pidwell. Fantastic interview. Also, um, always, always have this nearby. So always reading Think and Grow Rich. And so those are what are really what I'm reading right now. It's kind of interesting. I go through spurts. Uh, and right now, I guess I'm in that, that spurt, for lack of a better word, of reading books around um, abundance and wealth and what have you. So, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, I'll go through another phase <laughs> very soon as well. But that's the phase that I'm in right now. And also, I shared yesterday, we're working on the latest Blue Talks book as a Blue Talks update. Uh, we're working on the latest one, the holiday edition, and already starting to work on the New Year's edition as well, meaning the first uh, Blue Talks book of the New Year. So would love to have you join us uh, for that book. If you're so inclined, definitely reach out and let us know. Um, uh, let's see. So yeah, so um, yeah, in terms of uh, the book, if you'd like to be involved or learn more about that, then of course, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, by private message and let me know. And I'm happy to tell you more details about the next Blue Talks book or the New Year's one. Also, I mentioned yesterday, we're gonna be doing a, um, a Blue Talks awards show in the future as well. And yeah, so lots of cool stuff coming up. And yeah, I'd love to hear your questions around mindset. Feel free to pose them and that way when we have our guests on today and at least joins me, we can tackle that as well. So yeah, definitely feel free to post that also. And I'm going to go over to my page and, and put this at the top as well, the stream. This, here we go. Just trying to grab that. Of course, if you guys probably noticed Facebook, at least for me, they changed my um, profile around completely. And uh, yeah, so it's a little bit... Uh, Everything's different. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so let me know your questions and I'm gonna get ready to jump right into the meat of things. But I just, like I said, I just wanted to um, set the tone and then also pin this uh, video up to the top of my page so people will uh, see it right away. And at least, like I say, will be joining me in about 10 minutes. And uh, our guest that was supposed to be here, I'm not sure they may have had something interfere. So uh, if so, we'll reschedule them and look to bring them back on uh, for a future interview. So why don't I talk uh, and jump in and talk about uh, a few things I think that might be able to benefit you 
in terms of going forward around mindset. And so uh, first and foremost, I want to share a LinkedIn post that I did today and share what I learned from the experience and what you might be able to take from the experience. So this LinkedIn post that I posted today was around the idea of how we beat ourselves up over what the 99%, uh, you know, when we look at, for example, getting feedback from people or something we do, uh, you know, we have, let's say if 100 people were either in the room or watched our video or what have you, we, um, you know, we beat ourselves up over what the one person and or 1% said and disregard what the 99% or a person said, 99 people said out of 100. So, you know, for example, if we deliver a, a, a keynote talk and 100 people rate it and one says, oh, I wish you would have done this or I didn't like how you did this or what have you, we focus on our energy on that, you know, that one person and ignore the 99 who said, fantastic job. You know, 99% might have said, loved your talk. It was amazing. It was the best one of the conference. Well, we ignore that to focus on the one person or the 1% who said, I wish you would have done this instead, or I didn't like the temperature of the room, or I didn't like the shirt that you wore. It could be anything. I mean, and of course, I'm not trying to downplay their feedback. It could be legit. Look, here's why I didn't like what you did. But if 99 out of 100, you know, it resonated with what we did and liked what we did, then maybe we shouldn't be trying to change everything for the one. There's always going to be one that doesn't resonate and doesn't like what we did. And that's that's human nature. I mean, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I don't know about you, but I've gotten trapped in this idea of focusing too much on the one percent or the one person out of a hundred versus realizing that you know 99 are super happy and 99 uh, love the approach I took. And so that's the first thing I want you to take away today when it comes to mindset is get away from focusing on the one percent. Get away from focusing on the one time somebody said something to you that came across negative to you and focus on all the positive and all the good that you're doing. Remove it from you and focus on them, focus on their outcome. You know, whenever I started my speaking career, I, I, I don't even want to tell you how many sleepless hours I had going, oh my gosh, somebody said that I spoke too quickly during this talk or I didn't highlight this or I, again, I, I wore the wrong color shirt for the event or stuff like that. I mean, I really focused on that when I had all these other people saying, love the approach you took. In fact, I almost changed the way I spoke and almost changed my approach solely because of this. People would say, um, oh my God, you're so high energy, love it. And then one person would say, you're too high energy. And so I started debating, should I get rid of this? Should I change my energy level because that one person didn't like it? And so I finally surveyed some clients and asked why they hired me. And most of them said, we love your energy level. We love that we have to peel the people off the ceiling with a spatula because, you know, you were so high energy that it basically went all throughout the room. And uh, essentially, you know, we um, when we had that happen, like all this, we had this high energy and people were, um, you know, saying love it and resonated with it. And that's why we hire you. Then I realized, oh my gosh, I was about to get rid of and, and change the, the thing that most of my clients hire me for and like the most about me, all because I was focusing on the one out of 100. So again, the message here is stop getting hung up on and focusing on uh, what one person says and letting that control your life. When in many cases, you're probably impacting a lot more people and you're not gonna be for everybody anyway. We had Tasia Valenza, Emmy Award winner on here uh, previously, and Tasia had said that, somebody told her one time, you know, Tasia, not everybody likes uh, chocolate ice cream. You know, so Tasia might be uh, a, a strawberry ice cream person, you know, and so she might um, uh, love strawberry and somebody else might love chocolate. And so she gave the analogy or metaphor that for some people, she'll be the strawberry, and to other people, she'll be the chocolate, meaning that some people um, you know, might not resonate with her. Some people might not um, like her approach, and those are the people that like chocolate ice cream. And then some people might love her approach, and those are the people that love strawberry ice cream. And so it's just a metaphor, but uh, again, it's important to remember, you're not gonna be all things to all people, so all you can do is be the best you possible, and again, get away from focusing on that 1%. Why this is relevant today and why, uh, you know, this is, why this is timely 
is I did a talk last week, a virtual talk for a really big um, association. And my typical, and I say this not as a me ink thing, but just to give some context to this, but my typical approval rating as a speaker is in the 95 to 98% range. You know, so what that means is typically out of every 10 people, nine at least, and you know, typically more than nine. So it'd be like, uh, what was a 19 out of 20, uh, we'll say, we really enjoyed your talk. Here's why we liked it, all that kind of stuff. And uh, only one out of those 20 will say, we wish we would have done this or that. So my approval ratings normally, like I say, really high 90s. And I got my approval rating back from this uh, client and it was between 70 and 80%. So lowest approval rating in well over five years. And so why I bring all this up is because, and I'm going to bring Elise on in a second, I can see her backstage, but um, why I bring this up is it goes back to that point I was making is that for the last five plus years, my approval rating has been in the 90, high 90s, and this one time it's in the mid 70s, it would be easy to beat myself up over the mid 70s one without the reference point and the history to be able to look back and say, yeah, but to not, you know, to have not high 90s out of whatever amount of talks that is, hundreds of talks over the last number of years and have only one in the mid 70s, you know, you could look at it like I was due. You know, you're gonna have an audience that you don't resonate with. But years ago, I would have beat myself up over that. So again, my takeaway I want you to have is stop focusing on the, uh, the one or two that says, I wish you would change this or stop doing this or I don't like you because of this and focus on the eight or nine out of 10 whose lives you're actually impacting. And in this case here, uh, you know, with the mid 70s or whatever, it could be that I don't resonate with that type of association. It could be that I didn't do my research properly. It could be that it was a bad day. It could be that it was virtual and previously they hired me to become live, come in live. And so it was, didn't feel the same. It could be that, um, you know, it could be that two people were mad because they had to use virtual. It could be a million things. Uh, one person put a comment and said, they asked why they were there that day. And their answer was to get the certificate. You know, so they get a certificate for attending. So if that person was only there to get the certificate, chances are I was going to be an intrusion of their day no matter what. And so I just want you to look at it realistically and approach these things with uh, a little bit of lightness and stop beating yourself so up so much when you don't get the 95 or 99% or 98% approval rating. So it's a long tangent, maybe even a little bit of a rant, but I just, I, I, I know that I went through this period of thinking that I had to focus on the one out of a hundred that wanted me to wear a different shirt that day, rather than the 99 who said, loved your talk. So on that note, I'll bring on my co-host, Elise Roth. Sounds like a flip your script moment to me, Corey. Yeah, it, it totally is. <laughs> and it, you know, it's a more of a flip your script present day, me looking at what happened, saying that um, years ago, I would have it would have sunk me. Like I would have been in it and in a funk for a couple of days. So right. the, the flipping of the script for me is now these years later, I actually now can look at this in a different way and say, you know what, right. all the, all those hours I lost worrying about that one out of a hundred. I love, I love the like, yeah. So you don't like the color of my shirt. Maybe they're colorblind, you know, like you just don't know. And it's it, actually, it's a great message because Elliot and I were just chatting and we opened in December, this man, the retreat in December, and we've gotten incredible five-star reviews. People love it. It's a different experience. They love the beds. They love this. They love that. And lately, like every once in a while sprinkled in, we'll get a four-star review. And we like that first we looked at each other and we were like, four stars like what were they thinking and it, and it did it was like a moment of like huh? but then when we go back to the 222 reviews that we do have that are like you changed our lives our kids can't stop talking about your place like it's more than i've expected of all of the retreats we stayed our airbnbs in the whole world we've come to this is the most amazing experience we've ever had so okay so there's a couple of people that were six foot four and didn't fit in our queen size bed you know like so there are those moments that happened that we that we really I mean it's part of their journey as well. It's part of their journey as well. Absolutely, and and you know it's that's a great example is you know you guys are dealing with it firsthand. Like it's instant and it's the public and it's like anything could be said and it could be that they you know drove by and their tire got punctured and they realized it was across from your place and they never even stayed there. You know, I mean, I, obviously I realize in certain uh, online sites, they have to be verified, but you know what I'm saying? Like it could be something as simple as that. And right. yeah, so you have to realize that uh, maybe the four is to share one little idea that you guys could put in place that makes it a five every time in the future. 
Right. So you have to have beds that accommodate people who are six foot four. Yeah. It (laughs) could be something like that. And, but it helps you grow in the future. But the biggest thing is don't get sunk by it. Because that's what happened to me. I would beat myself up over it. Like, and then, you know, the worst is I'd have evaluation forms and and your name is optional as it should be. But I'm like, how can I reach this person to explain why this happened? Like, I literally be trying to say, I wore the red shirt because that when I woke up that morning, I just spilled something on the blue shirt that I planned to read or planned to wear. Right. And you know what? And, and, and it goes back to what we were talking about yesterday. It doesn't matter. It's how we feel. So if it's hitting us in a certain way that's bringing up an insecurity or a, I'm not enough, it means that we still have a little bit of insecurity or I'm not enough up in what I call our cup. So we have an opportunity to address it, look at it, let it go, and then continue to be in alignment with and inspired by what we are doing and enjoying that journey. So there are all these like opportunities to have that happen. Absolutely. And so at least you wouldn't know this, um, but uh, I got I got a message from Randy and he was uh, trying to log on. I think he's here now. Uh, so Randy, can you, I, I can see like your image here, but shows no camera. Can you hear us? Looks like a hubcap. Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. So you're not able to get video then, are you, Randy? Hello? Uh, let's see. It's, it seems to be that your um, your camera's got a cross on it, which means that your camera's off, maybe. And worst case scenario, we've done this once, twice before. We can just do the interview, Randy, without your face on the screen and then uh, figure it out later. Maybe. Oh, uh, I think it's happening. I think it's happening. Almost. Oh, there we go. Feels like it's halfway there. Can you still hear us? That's a question. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, says start camera. So, all right. Well, let's see what happens. I yeah, feel so- like wasn't there a game? A game where like people were behind the screen and you had to pick their voice and who were they? <laughs> I think so. Is that like, like a game you, show or something? Like the voice, the the singing competition. No, this where- was like way back, like with the pyramid and concentration. <laughs> The original Family Feud was the game and there were voices behind the curtain. Yeah, I watch the Game Show Network all the time, Elise, and I haven't come across that one yet, but I will let you know once I do. I'm going to let you know. I just watched the original Pyramid like last night. No joke. Do you remember that? They sat in these little booths that spun. I loved it. Pyramid. Yeah, absolutely. Just watched it. Um, So, Randy, why don't we jump in and we'll see what happens. Uh, We probably have about, I'd say, a half hour just for when our next guest comes on, just give you kind of a heads up. Uh, but Randy, um, it, it, we'll see if your camera does show up. If not, like I said, well, oh, there he is there. You did yeah. it. I willed it to happen. I delayed it enough to, to will it to happen, I think. Right uh, on, Corey. So Randy Brown, since we're, we're jumping in uh, a little bit late, I want to give you an opportunity immediately. We won't even do any little preamble talking, Elise and I. Uh, just give you an opportunity to, to tell us a little bit about yourself, Randy, before we maybe dive in to learn a little bit more about your thoughts, your feelings, and your approach to things. Well, I've known this guy, Corey, for a number of years now and learned a ton from him and just love his enthusiasm and his outlook. And he's been a, you've been a great mentor to me. So I I wanna start with that. Uh, I I live in Iowa. I am a, a speaker, an author, a former college basketball coach and I, essentially the way I sort of explain it to people is I learned so much as a coach and an educator was around Hall of Fame type of people for a lot of years. And just taking those uh, learning skills and those experiences and molding those into a personal story that I have to help people realize that if they're in the same boat, that there is certainly a way out. There's a way to be better. There's, there are skills that you can learn. And I I just, that that's my approach. And I was so fortunate to be around some of the most top notch people in athletics that um, it, yeah, I I really want to honor them by passing on what I've learned from them in, um, 
in what I speak about and, and, and write about. So essentially that's me. Well, that's okay, a, well now that's I know what you now I know I want to know what you learned. <laughs> oh well, and, boy. <laughs> all right, right, just like in a nutshell. Give me the cliff note version. <laughs> Well, oh boy! All right, Corey, go ahead. You could formulate. Well, the there answer. are it, there are just so many things. Uh, I, I'll tell you the maybe the the number one thing is just their ability. It wasn't coaching or or it wasn't that. It was managing people and understanding that everybody is different. And it's like being in a classroom of thirty. You can't try to teach everybody the same way. And boy, it's amazing with all the pressure and all the money and all that goes with every free throw and every game. It's it, you're asking a lot out of those guys that are pretty young and they're going through experiences for the first time. And so the way they were able to manage people and, and sort of push buttons and sort of massage egos and and all of those things, you know, when the ups and downs of, of athletics are the same as, as life. And you have to deal with young people who haven't been through those things and right. their world's falling apart. And it's not really falling apart. It's just that they missed a bunch of shots and we lost the game. So I, I would say that's that would be one of the top ones to answer right. your question. Yeah. I think that that, you know, tapping into that uniqueness, like everybody's unique, everyone yes. is different. And we don't know what they're going through when they're, when we're taking a shot in life, we don't know what that anyone's going through. No, we don't. And they all see it differently. You know, you get some, some from, from a, a, a tough background in Gary, Indiana, others from Plano, Texas. Um, you talking about completely different backgrounds and, and, and maybe values uh, it's just unbelievable. Just being on time sometimes is something that we had to teach some of our players, uh, a lot of them actually. And it sounds crazy, but you 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 take them where they are, mm -hmm. and and then you get them with the program, so to speak. Right. So and, that makes that's amazing. And it was a joy to see how far some of those young guys came academically, socially and athletically. And fortunately, a bunch of them ended up in the NBA and, and uh, uh, made a bunch of money and, and, and did that part of the game. And that makes you feel good too. But the rest of them I hear from, and they have families and they're doing just amazing things in their life. And that's the fruits of the labor that, that you get later on, which is a real, a real benefit of, being an educator, being a teacher, being a coach. Yeah, but I could already tell your vibe is like perfect. Like you were a game changer for these guys. Yeah, I I just loved it. You know, when you're passionate about something, it just comes through. Can't you tell, Corey? Like there's just like oozing from him. This like you know, like the proud dad. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And you know where I was going to go with that. Uh, and I'm, at least I'm glad you went there as far as what are the, you know, you mentioned like what's a, what's one common thing that they, they do or have in common that other people don't do, meaning these high level coaches and what have you. And I was going to go to the other side of that, which is the athletic side. I have quite a few friends that have coached athletes throughout the years. And first of all, what you said, Randy, they echoed that like the biggest achievement is the ones that maybe don't make it to the high level, but still you gave them life skills they can use for every aspect of their life. And that's one of the things I think we overlook a lot. Like we're, we have our son now in soccer, just started like four years old. He's in soccer for the first time. One day he loves it. The next day he's like, I'm not going back ever again. You know, we're going, we're at that stage. The other one's Absolutely. only little, he's not even close to that. And so, but what, what I find interesting is the life skills that mm -hmm. these athletes learn that we always overlook like people like well i don't have money to put them in sports so why bother there's not even any benefit or i don't want them in sports because they just fight when they're in hockey they just have fight on the on the ice so what's the sense of that or they're just chasing a ball but i think people when they say that you know when, when you they can't afford a part there's other options like i went to the boys and girls club my mom couldn't afford it but we went i went and played road hockey instead of ice hockey at the boys and girls right. club but my point is that there's so many life skills you learn from sport and martial arts and things like that, that I think sometimes parents overlook when they just blow it off as you're just chasing a ball around. Would they you do? They do. Like showing uh, up on time. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, that has everything to do with mind, like self-concept, because if somebody doesn't feel like they're important, then it really doesn't matter if they show up in time or not. Right. You know what I mean? So it goes deeper right. than just not having a good organized mind. 
It's yeah, about exactly. value, but you matter. And if you don't show up, then the team's waiting for you, you know, like, and so that is huge. Two real quick things, just listening to Corey. One is a lot of times there are, there are delayed benefits. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I've heard coach. I had no idea why our, why the coaching staff was so hard on me as, as a player. He, and they'll say, now I get it. And I'm so thankful that you were relentless because you helped me get to where not only I got in athletics, but later on as I had kids and I had a family and I was in a difficult uh, situation with my work and I had to find a way to work through that. Uh, with deadlines, maybe, or tough projects or whatever. The second real quick thing is I've talked to probably hundreds of employers that have been in interviews, and when a former athlete gives a little bit of their background and they say, and it could be in any sport, but our, our guys would say, and I was a college basketball player at the University of Arizona, and it's like the lights come on in this interview room because people know what it takes to perform at those high levels. It's like Olympians. And that means so much. And I've had many of them tell me it was close, but that was the thing that turned it. And that's, I hired them because of what I know that they went through and the things that they've learned in athletics. It's amazing. And you know, Alicia liked this probably too, but, uh, it's on the hockey side, but it makes me think of the story I want to share that relates to, I just talked about it off the top about this lower rating I got for speaking first time in a long, long time. And uh, I it was teaching on the timeless secrets of influential leaders. And what I was teaching them is the personal and professional side, and then how you bring it into your work. But I think because of the way that they're leaders in this, in this industry, they didn't necessarily understand the connection. But to give you an example, because it relates to sports, is I put a picture up of um, Sidney Crosby, you know, one of the top hockey players of all time. I mean, compared right. to Gretzky over the years. And one of my friends was his coach, like skating coach, helped him growing, like right from the time Sidney was like nine years of age. And his name is Doug. And I said, uh, so Sidney had got injured and Doug was going to be helping him get back into playing shape. And I said to Doug, well, what can you teach a dude? Like, I've always been curious about this. If you, How can you coach Wayne Gretzky? Like if, like, if you're a hockey player, how can you teach Wayne Gretzky anything new? I mean, he's already doing 99% of it well. So I said the same thing about Sidney Crosby and Doug said, stop right there, Corey. That's the key thing. You just said the key words. He's doing 99% of it well. So what I'm trying to do is if in that 1% he's not doing yet, I'm trying to find out one different way he could skate, you know, one different movie could make that could get him a goal a game. And that's right. changing everything. And so the example I tried to give to these people in the in the session is you need to work on your 1%. So many of right. and your 1% could be way bigger than his, obviously. But right. so many people ignore it and go, well, I've already got it all figured out. But imagine if we were open to being coached. Imagine if we were open to feedback about what we could improve. To me, that's a complete leadership skill. As a leader, well, you need to work on your 1%. But this, you know, that to me is a great example of sport because I asked Doug about this question about an athlete and he turned it around. I mean, it turned into a leadership lesson. Absolutely. You know, NBA players in the summer, and I, I tell this to all the young people that I'm around and in the gym with these days, and I say, what do you think the NBA guys do? What does Kevin Durant do in the summer? And they, you know, they say, well, he, he hangs out, he goes, he's by the pool, he's this and that. Now, he might by the, be by the pool a little bit, but what, what shocks these guys is Kevin Durant may, and, and they all have trainers, like you said, they have high price trainers that that really push them and get in the gym. So, for instance, I've heard of a lot of players, they spend the entire summer working on those two feet that they have supporting their body. And these young guys will look at me like, I don't understand. Well, footwork is a foundation of every sport. It has a lot to do with balance, has a lot to do with which direction and which angle you're going, fast, slow, change of, change of speed, change of pace. And they will spend the entire summer working on their feet. There's, there's part of your 1%. That is so true. Because Kevin Durant knows how to shoot. We know that, okay? To put him through drills all summer, it just – might help him maybe a shot or two, but but the feet are so important. 
And well, that, uh, th that's a great lesson for young, young players. Well, the late uh, Kobe Bryant, was it him that, I think it was Kobe. It, may, it might be another player, but I, it may have been Scottie Pippen. One of the two of them, you'd probably know this answer better than me, Randy. I just remember the story. One of the two of them used to go in. They were the ones that turned the lights on, not the coach or the janitor or anything else. And I forget the number, but they would take like a thousand shots before any other player showed up in the building. Mm -hmm. And whoever it was, oh, one of the two of them, but it was ever, they're playing at the highest level possible and playing at a higher level perhaps than a lot of the other players in the league and still going in and shooting a thousand shots before the other guys even show up for the day. Right. That was Kobe and it was 4.30. 4.30 a.m. And I mean, you know, at least if you think about that, it's, it goes back to what we were just talking about, but are you working on your 1%? And I think a lot of people take it for granted. I made it to the big leagues. I don't need to, to work on this anymore. Yes. Uh, yes. We, I have a friend as well, um, Rob Brown, who uh, played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Again, back to hockey. But he played with Mario Lemieux and Jeremy Egger on the same line. He was the third guy. And I said, what did you notice that they had in common? And he said it was the quiet confidence. He said they would practice so much that if we needed that last game goal, they had the confidence that they could get it where somebody else would be a little shattered or didn't have the confidence sure. so they might miss that shot. But he said it was just they walked around with this quiet confidence that they they could lead us and they could take us to the promised land. But he said why they had that is because they put in the time when nobody else was, even right. when they were already at greatness at that level. So I think this is just a common theme around mindset. Be willing to work on the stuff that nobody else will, even long after you think you don't have to work on it anymore. Right. John Wooden was famous for saying, when you're done learning, you're done. Mm. So That's pretty good. Oh, at least you're, you're on mute. Yeah. So I have a quick question for you on the other side of things, not big hockey, football. I get the whole mindset thing. How have you transitioned that from being a, an athletic coach? Are you still coaching athletes? Like, so for people who are listening, what, how are you taking these skills that you've acquired, right, in guiding these amazing beings into being amazing beings? How are you transitioning that or how have you transitioned that? I uh, appreciate that question. In a lot of different ways, I, I am working on um, teaching skills to young players, and I just absolutely love it. It's as good as working with any college and the big arenas and everything. I just love it because they're, they're a sieve. Uh, so th that's an application. Uh, another application would be uh, I have a mentoring program where I have I, I, I thought a way to give back to the game and to not throw away a lot of what I've what I've learned through the years is to mentor young coaches who desire to be college coaches. I was that guy at age 20 at the University of Iowa. I knew what I wanted to do, had no clue how to do it. And to this day, it's not offered in any university, uh, the, the art of becoming a college coach. And I'm heavy in networking, relationships, heavy, because that's what allows my guys to move on. So I've taken what I actually went through at age 20 and 21 to become a college coach, and then all I learned after that into a program where, where I can teach them and say, these are the skills that I can teach you that you're going to need to get your first job. You can't become a head coach right out of the gate. Let's help you get your first job, and we'll go from there. And I'm proud to say that in eight years, nine years, we've had 130 uh, come out of the program that have got their entry-level college job, and eight of those – uh, 130 are currently in the NBA, and I it, love it's, it. it 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 uh, primarily was because I taught them the we we took the art of six degrees is what we did, six and separation. and we really magnified it though, and I had them draw out their own network, and then from there how it multiplies. But then that's great, and it's a nice diagram, but it's the skills to put the two together and, oh, how do you build a relationship? How do you get to know someone who's a third degree relationship? Mm -hmm. You don't know him, but if you connect the dots, you're connected to him. How can you use that to get to know that person? And they were fabulous. The ones that really locked into that are the ones who were successful getting their, their job. And I'd say uh, the last thing would be 
from a personal standpoint, taking what I've learned and what I've gone through uh, as as a um, as a husband and and as a father and as a son and all the life experiences I've been through uh, in my speaking mm -hmm. to be able to to let people know that they're not alone, that uh, that nobody has uh, nobody's free of adversity. What you do in that moment um, is to me, respond and not react. And it's making a decision that you're going to use that hurdle to become a better person. It's the decision that is paramount. Everybody wants to get better, but it, you know, it's like all those people before the, the new year, right? That get that membership to the, to the gym. Mm -hmm. They all want to lose 20 pounds. There's no question. A hundred percent of them do. How many of them in at the end of February are going to be going three times a week. They didn't decide and make that commitment. And I think that life is difficult sometimes to an unbelievable level that if we get sucked into these obstacles, life is going to get even more difficult. And I really believe that, that small comebacks equal huge comebacks. And I've personally been able to make a huge comeback. And that's why I'm so optimistic about, about the people that are surround that, uh, that I'm surrounded by and that I get a chance to work with. So th there's three quick things um, just to give you an idea of how I've taken my experiences and I'm using them today. Well, well they, they might be quick, but they're definitely profound, especially taking this and creating a brand. It's kind of like a brand right. that doesn't exist and you're helping these individuals with the knowledge. You're putting the package together. It's like yeah. concept execution distribution. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a serial brand architect and entrepreneur, I totally appreciate your ability to take that and, and put it together in that way. Because that's key. That is key. Don't you yeah. think, Corey? I mean. I do. And, wow. and I love the, the six degree of separation thing. Uh, it's, it's interesting, Randy. I've been thinking of at some point, I, I mean, I've got enough things ahead of me that I'm not worried about right now, but I've been thinking about putting a, a like a, and I don't know what I would call it, but a six degree of separation course together, but how to connect with influencers. But the reason is because then I can stop saying to people I really like, sorry, I can't give you Lisa Nichols home phone number. You know, like I, right. I so what I mean is I want to teach people how to get that themselves rather than thinking yes. I'm gonna brand Randy or Corey and ask for their contacts. And you know, I, I'm a small, like, and to po point out what can be done, I mean, you've done it yourself on the elite coaching side, and this isn't a me ink thing, but I'm from a small little tiny little town where we had to wait for the Metal Edge magazine, and we could only get it once a month, and if it didn't show up, we didn't even know how to get it because you couldn't get it online. Right. Uh, and, you know, now, I just was thinking about the other day, and I have, I can get a message through to Will Smith right now. I wow. mean, like, you know, like, to think about one, and because I'm one degree away. I yeah. I'm, I'm in contact with and and I've interviewed recently and I, and I would call myself a friend of his life coach. So I'm one degree away from Will Smith and yet I was the small town guy that I'm sure if you asked me, is there any way I could contact any of these high level influencers? I would say, of course not. There's no way I could ever reach them because Absolutely. I was a small town mentality type lifestyle where I'm thinking, no, my life is uh, you know 45 kilometers on each direction. But my, right. my point, Randy, is I love what you're doing because I think it's important. A lot of people want to know, how do I build my network? It doesn't have to be big level influencers, but once you understand, like you can put on a board and say, oh my God, we really truly are all six degrees or less away. Like that's legit. By We're the way. connected. It's yes. so legit. Like, oh so, so, my so gosh. legit. Yeah, it's so amazing. There's people confidence once they realize that. So I love that you're doing that for coaches is what I'm trying to say. I, I think a college degree is fantastic. You know, when I talk to young people, who have got out of college and don't have a job yet, I always think, why were they not taught relationship building? Because that job is done. As soon as they get their degree, they're hired the next week because mm -hmm. you can do that all the way through your college career and have this entire huge network built and you get done, you get your degree and boom, there you go. But that's where they start aligning with people. And it's too mm -hmm. late. I mean, it really shouldn't be like that. You, well, you, that's you, where you come in. Exactly. Right. You're a fan. I know, Randy, we've talked about it before. I'm pretty sure you said you're a fan of Zig Ziglar. And yes. 
If so, Zig Ziglar had the quote, and at least I know you've heard me say it here before, dig your well before you're thirsty. You know, and that's what these students could be doing is all the way through college, dig the well before they ever have to take one sip from it or one drink from it. So I love that. And so, Randy, just diving into that a step further, um, this is something I think that should be, I mean, not saying we can change it. It's good that you're doing it uh, regardless. But this is something that should be taught in school. I mean, this is something that should be taught in junior high, you know, let alone college. Well, even elementary school, I got to be honest, we maybe underestimate our inner child, you know, (laughs) with our inner child knew a lot more than we gave our inner child credit for. So even starting in elementary school about forming relationships. And 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 I have to tell you that I I met one of the one of the great drummers of all time in in rock music, Kenny Aronoff. And and Kenny and I, I met him. We talked for 20 minutes. At, at an event where he was speaking, we've become really good friends. And and uh, I can't tell you how many big time musicians that I have waited around to speak to, to say, blah, blah, blah. By the way, Kenny's a good friend. And it's like, that guy's my buddy. You know, um, I, I could name a bunch of them, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, and I met Kenny and he told me something that was so profound. He said, when I meet somebody for the first time, and this guy's a relentless networker, relentless every day. And if he meets, let's say, uh, uh, somebody in film, somebody, a producer, somebody in music he doesn't know, which is kind of rare. He said, when I shake hands with him, I look in their eyes and I see a thousand people that they know that I don't know yet. So what he's saying is those are a thousand two degree people that are just waiting for Kenny to get to know, and he will get to know through the person he's shaking that hand with. It about knocked me over. I thought that was just such a cool way to- Well, next time you see him, thank him for me, because I'm going to look people in the eye, and I'm going to see the same thing from now on. Now I'm looking you in the eye, Randy, and I'm seeing (laughs) a thousand people that I haven't met yet. (laughs) He's in Las Vegas right now with uh, with John Fogarty. Oh, I love John Fogarty. Yeah. So, you know, not that I mean, I've met him yet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, you're only two degrees away now because I know, Randy I knows Kenny it. and Kenny knows. John. So, but, right. but what I, I love that because what it also does, like we always worry about, you know, let's not look at people like a certain way, like they have this much money or they have this or that. But what I love about that is you're actually putting even more value in the person because you're like, other people just blow them off. Like think about how many times in sales people walk in the front door of a place and then blow off the reception trying to get to the president. But what right, he's right. doing is he's going, you know what? There's so much magic that could be created here between me and this person. In my opinion, right, he's right. not looking at it like, here's what I can get from it. He's looking at it like this person's valuable. This person right, has right. value. And I mean, like, not just because of who they know. I just mean as a person, like I'm yeah. going to take the time to get to know this person. Absolutely. And I, I tell the guys I mentor, assistant coaches become head coaches. Don't look down on someone because he's a division three assistant coach, because in seven years, you're going to be interviewing with him and you will wish that 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 you had corresponded with him and and built that relationship, not treated him like what he was, treat him like what he might become. And then when that moment hits, you're like, oh, I'm glad I spent all that time doing that. I love that. That's a a great soundbite, by the way. Stop treating people like who they, who you think they are and treat them like who they could become. Absolutely. Or who they already are that you don't know because you're already judging them right. before you have yeah. a conversation. <laughs> right. It could be any aspect of that. But, exactly. You know, people, again, try to look at- That's a good people. mind seed right there. Like that, yeah. we could plant, if you plant that in your life today, things will start to change. One of the secrets I teach is to find out what a person's a person they want to meet, let's say that's really a high level coach or musician or whatever the, the case may be, author, find out what motivates them. What are they really passionate about? Is it surfing? Is it gardening? Is it bicycling? Is it music? So so what my guys do, so I have them. It's an it's like an assignment, but but it's got to be a habit. I said, write down all the things that you can find out these days, of course, that moves this person. All right. Instead of just writing them a note, hey, blah, 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 I'm a young assistant, you know, kind of one of those vanilla notes. What I have them do is if golf, this is just an example, if golf is one of their passions, 
I say go buy a sleeve of three golf balls, three Titleist golf balls, put them in a package with a handwritten note. You don't even know this guy, but you want to get to know him. Send it to him. You talk about getting a response. And, and what the, the greatest thing that happens in that moment is the coach that receives it, you know, if it's Jay Wright at Villanova, okay, his first thought is that's ingenious, that's creative, and it took time and effort for him to do that. Mm -hmm. Who is this young guy? And he could have 30 other handwritten notes or type notes or, you know, what uh, emails, okay, which I deplore with my guys. I said, no, 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 we're not doing that because everybody else does that. And they get those golf balls. And I mean, it is like an invitation to meet and get to know that big time coach. And the final four is a great place because you everybody's there and you're going to meet all these people. So they have this laundry list of all these people they've either sent golf balls to or, you know, wh whatever the case may be. Seeds, you know, the uh, you know, flower seeds or whatever, if the guy's into gardening, whatever. And then they meet him at the final four and it's like they went to grade school together. It's so huge. Randy, Randy it's I love that. Well, I, I, sorry to interject. I was just going to say, I, I love that. And I, before we bring on our next guest, I want to uh, ask you how we can learn more about your work and, and your program and stuff like that. But I do want to add to what you just said. And again, sorry to interject. I just thought this is good timing for this, but um, and at least I don't even know if you've heard this story before. But we had a guy named John Tellerico, and I don't think he was on Flip Your Script. I think he was on our Amplify Your Message event. And John, uh, do you remember John? No, I don't think okay. he was. Okay, so John, what he did, which I think is so brilliant, and it's what you said, Randy, but like what you said almost on steroids, like just next level. But what he did was he wanted to uh, – if you guys ever read uh, Think and Grow Rich, I never have far from me. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a story about how uh, Burns uh, basically thought his way into partnership with uh, Thomas Edison. And so this is what basically John did. He said he wanted to, whether it's in partnership with or just get to know him, but he wanted to get to work with or get an audience of Bob Proctor. So what John did was he, he went to a few Bob Proctor events and he noticed a common theme. John played or Bob played the song. I think it's the song I can see clearly now. And so, but he kept playing the same song over and over. And John's like, hmm. I know what I'm going to do. So he reached out to the, the family of the singer. Singer was still alive. And he said, if I pay for a postage paid envelope, I think he even said, like, if I give you guys $100 for, you know, for the fact that you're doing this for me and buy the record, would you send me the record, the, one of the original records and his signature to Bob saying, you know, Bob, I'm so happy you play my music every time you run an event. And then John took that and got it framed. And then he wow. took the and he left it at the front desk of the hotel under Bob's name. He didn't, and he was in the event while he dropped it off. Like Bob was there, and instead of him going to Bob and say, "Here you go," and right. everybody, Bob telling everybody, "Oh, look what this guy did for me," and feeling obligated, he left it at the front and just went along his merry way. And after the event was over, Bob's brother called and said, "John, you know, Bob loves the gift you gave me. Wants to meet you. Is that cool?" And it all happened because you know, like he said, he spent a hundred some dollars being creative. And he said, if nothing ever happens out of it, Bob's impacted my life uh, at, at a level that's worth more than the money I spent on. So at, at least I'm just giving right. back to what he's given me. Right. But think about what you just said, Randy, like the, the, the creativity to do that. And who's going to ignore that? You know, like he went so far no, in his way. Singer to write, you know, be like, if you were into B.B. King and B.B. King wrote you a letter and said, Randy, I love your basketball playing. I mean, you're going to remember that forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. think it's brilliant, yeah. but I'm sure that you I'm I'm going to I'm going to bet that you agree with us both of you that that's great if you have the enough enough courage and enough confidence to take that action. It's one yes. thing to be able to come up with the idea and find the receptionist. Right. But I'm sure that there and I know for my clients, really, the first step is recognizing our own value and owning our life and then getting the painting and showing up and doing all of that. Right. So um, I guess my question, my, my closing question would be, what would be one thing that you would maybe recommend somebody or suggest, or we call it planting a mind seed to somebody who would like to have the courage to be able to do something like that, but is just a little bit, you know, not ready to, to kind of put themselves out there for fear of dot, dot, dot. Right. So, so I'll, I'll ask him about, I'll say, how about Bill Self at the University of Kansas? He's already in the Naismith or, or Hall of Fame. 
I mean, he's already in the Hall of Fame and he's still coaching in college, right? So he's one of the big, big guys. And I ask him, I say, true or false, at one time, Bill Self didn't know one person in basketball. Bill Self had not won a game. Mm -hmm. Bill Self maybe had not gone to a coaching clinic yet. Who does he sound like? Well, he sounds like me. And, and so now I'm, I'm telling them that, that and it's kind of the reverse of what I said earlier, but I'm telling them that these guys who are big time now started out right where they're starting out. And they, they don't get it for a while. And then they're like, yeah, you're probably right. He probably didn't know anybody. You know, I know two people. So I, what I try to do is, is even that, that, that field for them. So mm -hmm. they realize that I love that's brilliant. You are because, brilliant. Because when I went through it, when I was that age, I was frightened by big time coaches. Mm -hmm. I was admittedly. And I really had to get over that because they're just coaches. They're just people. They're just guys. It's just that they've won a lot of games. They make a lot of money and they're on TV a lot. Big deal. And they've you know, jumped a lot, jumped through a lot of hoops. <laughs> so they have. Yeah. They just didn't go to University of Kansas. You know, they had to jump yeah. through a lot of hoops. So it also gives them makes there's a connection. We're more similar than we went than we perceive. Right? Much more. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Yes. I'm going to take that too. You have so many great tips. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. I like, so Randy, I like this guy, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And Randy, I just wanted to just the, the final thing. I know our, our next guest is waiting backstage. So I want to just ask you really quick, uh, how can people connect with Randy and learn more and all that kind of good stuff? Okay. You know, normally I would, I would push websites and things like that. What, what I do is, is I say that, and I'm on about every platform uh, with social media and I have some pretty big uh, followings, which is great. Um, on LinkedIn and, and uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram. So that's probably the number one way. And I, what I like about that is people can direct message you. Uh, I like that a lot. And I just wanted to mention too, uh, in 2018, I wrote a book called Rebound Forward. And, and it's not a basketball book, although it sounds like it because of the word rebound. Rebound is more about the comeback. It's getting off the mat when you get knocked down and it's rebounding. And then the idea is when you decide to get up, moving forward, not staying still, not moving back, but moving forward. And so that's a, that's the title of my book that you, you know, you can get about anywhere out there and um, really, really proud of the book. Oh, that's awesome. So you're Randy Brown or is it Randy like underscore Brown or no, uh, your no it's just, yeah. It's, it's just my name. Okay. So Instagram, yeah. or, Twitter, or, or, LinkedIn. Or, or Coach RB. Uh, that, that's kind of my, that's kind of my basketball Your handle? Uh, you, monitor. Is it a yeah. handle? <laughs> Coach RB or Randy Brown. But man, thanks for having me. This has been a blast. I love talking about these things. Well, it was an awesome. absolute Great pleasure. Guest. Yeah, 100% Randy. And uh, and 100% Alicia Wright. Great guest. So Randy, we'll call this to be continued and look to bring you on down the road, one platform or another. Uh, but just keep on doing the great work you're doing. And uh, like I say, to be continued, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, Randy. We'll let you run. And at least one thing I was going to mention um, is about the uh, the idea of, um, when I mentioned that about uh, John Tallarico and Bob Proctor, the one thing I didn't finish, which is kind of important, when I said he gave them that, that frame thing and got a chance to meet him, is now they're business partners. Wow. So I, he wanted to think his way into business with Bob Proctor and did so. And then he was able to leverage that relationship. And he's also business partners with Les Brown. So that's amazing. All that's from that. Amazing. It all started with that one action. So, so just do it. Right. I mean, just talk about it. a sports, a sports, uh, whatever. What is it? A sports uh, Nike. It's a Nike. Yeah, well, no, I know it's Nike, but it's their it's their uh, tagline. So just yeah. do it. That'll be our tagline today. Just do it. Slogan. I think it is. Slogan, Slogan is it tagline. Yeah. All right. On that note, let's bring on, as, uh, really, it has nothing let's to do with that. Do at all. <laughs> but uh, let's just do it and bring our next guest on. And so, Teresa Greco, so excited to have you here today. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And yes. so, I, I know you guys haven't met yet, I don't think. Uh, 
Thanks. Nope, I've just seen your picture. I get to know you a little bit behind the scenes when I put your like little social media bites together. <laughs> so you're awesome. just as beautiful virtually as you are in your photo. Thank you. <laughs> awesome stuff. Well, Teresa, where we like to start on these uh, interviews is really to get the guests to tell us a little bit about themselves, uh, rather than like I always say, me reading a bio on a screen in front of the screen. Uh, so can you perhaps just tell us a little bit about who you are before we dive in, and you don't have to worry about how deep you go because we'll we'll dive in deeper anyway. Uh, but just a little bit about who you are for those that might be discovering you for the first time today. Like me. So I'm Teresa Greco. I'm a happiness coach. I am the weekly host of our radio and internet TV show called The Steps to Happiness Show with Teresa Greco. I'm a spiritual coach, a meditation coach, a Reiki master. I am the editor at two international Canadian lifestyle magazines. I write for five international magazines. I am a two-time best-selling author. I am an educator, educational technologies consultant, and a mom. Wow. <laughs> okay. So I love how you like just like like uh, went through all of that and you're like and a mom. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's another job too. That's another well that's like the first job, right? Like that's the first job that you do when you like get up in the morning and like you know all along it's Continual, probably the. And how many children do you have? Like have you know, a mom of two? Yes, two teenagers. Wow, and, I even look old enough. And to your point, at least when she said, "Just I'm just full of compliments today, Corey. Bring it on." Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, and and to your point about you know how uh, how she just kind of dropped that in there <laughs> and the mom, and but mom. it's it's like as we know. Well, I think as most guys know because they know they could never do it. Most guys know it's like the the toughest job. I mean, yes. you put it in there as the last one, but it's really. I think it's, and it's the most important. I think it's the most vital because really as a mom, we could be, do you know how many individuals I work with chronologically who are 60, 70, 80, 50, but really it's their inner child who really needed a mom and still needs the mom. Mm -hmm. So it's really the most important job and the most game changing job is being the mom and the dad, of course, Corey and the dad. Absolutely. So I, I think where I'd like to start, Teresa, is we talk a lot about mindset on here. And I'd love to get, I mean, we don't usually ask it this way. So, I mean, there's no usual, I guess. It's always different. But what is your take on mindset? Like, how important do you think mindset is? Do you put much focus on your own mindset? Like, I'd just love to get your thought around mindset. I'm going to add to that, too. How important do you think it is to be aware of where your mind is set? Because we all have a mindset, but it just, where is it set? So it's the awareness of where the mind is set and yeah. how to reset it, so to speak. Yes, yes. So hugely important in that it, it it's the work that I do every day on myself to rewire my brain, to re reset the story that of my life that I was living before. And now I'm in the process of, of waking up to a whole bunch of subconscious beliefs and conditioning and patterns and habits that I was living my life by and now come up and I can now identify them as a limiting belief or a self-sabotaging belief or a conditioning belief or whatever it is and, and ask myself some questions about, you know, why do I think this about myself or about the situation? Is it true? Who told me that? And in being critical about your thought, you're then able to change it and replace it with one that serves you instead. And so when we understand that our brain has 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, that's a lot of thoughts, 60 to 70,000 a day, and 95% of them are the same as the ones you had the day before. So that means that most we're waking up as the same person every day, right? with every the same day. and we're living in our past every day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that leaves us a 5% margin to be cognitive of our beliefs. So just to actually answer both of your questions, right. Is that if it leaves us 5% and the 95% is where is the mental set, as you said, because we've been thinking it for most of our life, is that it leaves us 5% every day to be to become aware of those thoughts and to actively make a change. Because we are we are set and programmed to be who we've been our entire life. And if we want to be somebody different and and to live our best lives and and 
our true and authentic self and live to our fullest potential, we have to become very aware of that 5% margin that we can actually make a change. What she said. That is so, <laughs> it's so, it's true. It's if we wake up thinking the same things and mm -hmm. we're keeping ourselves in the same place Stop. that we were Stop. and we can do that all day long and for our whole lives. And, and so it is that awareness. It's that like one thought is all it takes to change a belief. And that's the beautiful piece. Not so, not, it's simple, but it's not easy. No, no, it's an everyday process because it took me 40 years to get to the point that I'm at now. And now I'm, I'm, I'm uncovering who I really am. That part Girl, I'm 53. I'm going to be 54. So, and I'm right there with you. I was always a late bloomer, but like, I'm, you know, and I think it's just continual. It's just once you mm -hmm. have that awareness, I always mm -hmm. say you can't unknow what you know. Mm-hmm. Right no, and why would you want to? That's the whole benefit of like grow of of aging and growing old is that we learn more and we know more. I would never want to unknow what I know because right. But some people like are like, yeah, well, I already know that, and they do something else. But but you can't unknow it. Like it's just mm -hmm. as valid and just as true for you as it was when it was true for you that one time. Mm -hmm. So that knowing is a gift and sometimes we just don't know which is where you come in i'm sure a lot of people aren't aware it's one of the things that's intriguing to me about this conversation too at least this is a kind of a throwback to yesterday because we were talking about this book that i'm reading the mindset code yes and uh it's by cappy pidwell i'll give her another shout out and that's what she focuses on is helping and she i didn't say this yesterday but she works with like CEOs of Microsoft and Apple and stuff like that and basically rewiring their mindset. But it, but it's all around what you're talking about here, Teresa, because it's kind of funny. I was talking about this yesterday. She talks about your conscious mind is five to 10 percent and all the rest of the stuff is stuff you learned up until really the age of 18. And now you're just repeating. And so in her book, she talks about what, how you have to actually like what she says, which I love is that your garage is full now. Your mind is full. And if you want to stuff a new belief in there, you need to find a way to get an old belief, whether it's out or reframe delete, it or delete, whatever delete. it is, you know, flip the script on it or whatever. But she's saying you have to tackle that because like if you want to lose weight, but you have these beliefs of I can't lose weight because I'm over 40. I, uh, I can't lose weight because I eat this certain type of food. I can't quit this food because of whatever. She's saying you have to unravel all these beliefs if you're going to have any hope of being super successful with changing it. And she said, like, yes, we see people that change it, but they're in the like the one to three percent. You know, there's not many people that can fully change it just randomly from cold turkey, you know, mm -hmm. off of saying with my conscious mind, I'm going to change it. Most people don't. So I like what you're saying here, because, A, we need to be the, the 5 percent. We need to be conscious of what's going on and be willing to change that what's in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And then, B, know that we've had these beliefs for a long time. Like you, the, what made me think of this, because you said, you know, you've had them 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like if you ate fast food every day for 10 years and then start complaining, well, I've been working out for three days, how come the weight's not gone? Mm -hmm. You know, you need to really recheck that because you've spent a lot of years building it. It's gonna take at least a little bit of time to unbuild it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just, it just reminds me of me reading this book right now. So it's like front and center for me. So I, I have a personal, oh, go ahead. I just, wanted, I just want to piggyback on that. And so I don't know if you're familiar with the Untethered Soul and sorry, I'm, yeah, and by Michael Singer in that, I really love his perspective on the fact that then the thoughts in our in our brain are is just the ugly roommate that goes blah 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 all the time, spewing all the like the negative thoughts and the limiting beliefs and um, us playing it small and you can't do this and you're not you're not enough you're not good enough you're not skinny enough you're not pretty enough you're not athletic enough you're not, I had lots of of my roommates spewing ugly stuff to me that I thought was me. So let's take it a little bit further. And when you, when you can then realize that the thoughts in your head are not actually you. So my spiritual self, that part of me is whole and perfect, just as I am. And this roommate that wants to spew these negative thoughts and, and beliefs at me, that's not even who I am. So I completely, at the same time, also detached myself from what my brain wants to say from the mind, which is the immortal and eternal and infinite part of myself that is whole and perfect and untouched, just as I am. And I don't have to be more and I don't have to be um, 
that I'm worthy and, and perfect just as I am. And so when we can detach ourselves from our brain and those thoughts and not identify yourself with that, that it's just the ugly roommate in your head that wants to keep you down and wants to have you playing it small and doesn't want you to forgive people that have done you wrong and doesn't want to let you, have you let go of, of your past and the trauma and the rejection and the upset and the guilt and the shame and all this other stuff that we carry on our back. Let's separate ourselves and identify that that's not even us. And then that allows us to forgive and to let it go and to move past it, knowing that you are whole and perfect um, and untouched from any of the baggage. Well, it almost makes me think, and Elise, you can jump in on this, but it makes me think too, kind of the combination of the two of them, the idea of the, you know, the stuff that has been a pattern since like a Cappy and you, you and Lisa, you and I were talking about this yesterday from like zero to, because it's like in the womb, it's even before you're one. You know, like the idea of, or even before you were came out of the womb, the idea of all these patterns that put in your head. So if I if I take both of those, and I might be way off here, Teresa, but if I take both of those, it's almost me like you are perfect and whole when you were like zero, and then all of a sudden all this input came mm -hmm. in, and now all of a sudden you're dealing with all these other ideas and conditioning and all this other stuff that happened and built on top of it. But that pure perfect whole mind is the one that was untouched. So. You know what I mean? Like untouched before all yeah. this stuff happened, all these patterns. And so we can get back to that. That's how I read that. I, I don't know if I'm right on that. but Yes. And that's my view on happiness is that we are love, peace, and happiness at our core. It is happiness is our essential nature. It's who we really are. That when we are born into this world, as you said, we are that love, peace, and happiness. But the world takes us away from that and has us feeling a whole bunch of like negative emotions. And then we identify, many people identify with those, with those negative emotions that I am depressed. I am, no, it's like, no, you are not your depression. You are not your anxiety. You're feeling depressed. Yes, <laughs> right? But happiness, and they also view happiness as an, as an emotion, that it's a state of mind, that you feel happy when you're participating in activities that you like, you're on vacation, you're happy because you bought that designer purse, you're happy because you've achieved that promotion at work. And then all of a sudden now, oh no, I'm having a fight with my co-worker, I'm in traffic, my house is a disaster, and now I'm not feeling happy anymore. No. We are happiness. Love, peace, and happiness is who we who we are. The world is taking us away from that. And so my view on happiness is very different than that, let's say, like, I don't know, the status, the status quo idea that happiness is something that we feel. It's some it's a transient emotion. Happiness is not that. Happiness is our essential nature. We are happiness at our core. And so what it, what we need to do then is to remove the blocks to allow us to feel the happiness that's within us that's always there. And that because, as you said, the negative beliefs are having you think things about yourself that aren't true. And so then you're not, you're creating a block to feeling the happiness that's within you. And so it, life is really about removing the blocks to return you to your essential nature, which is love, peace, and happiness. You are that, as you said, from zero, when you were born into the world, that's who you are. It's, I mean, it's so amazing because we talk about, um, you know, the idea of a child, you know, who's so like, just like I'm will, like I'm willing to run around the store and yell stuff and hang out and all and like so free. Yes. And then we add all these things on, and all of a sudden it's not cool to be that way anymore. And I find myself getting trapped into the adult thinking too sometimes, like that's been conditioned over the years. And at least I know you want to jump in a couple of times, so I'm just going to finish this one statement. But you know, it's like I had a couple of times recently, and I don't know, and I got to I got to go inward and see why this even mattered to me. But I've had people like in the store walking down the aisle whistling because a song's on and I'm going, we don't want to hear your whistling lady. And, but why am I, why am I saying that? Like what, what in me, like, why shouldn't I it's want that? It's the in you, Corey. <laughs> like, but why wouldn't I want that joy? You know, so if my son was with me at the same store at the exact same minute and it wasn't that lady, it was my son whistling. I'd be like, oh, to be so young, oh, to be so joyful. So why is it cool that he's doing it? But this lady. I don't know, Corey. Let's go through this. Why was? You know what I mean, though, right? So like, frustrating. I know it's not. I know it's cool that she's doing it. I know I should be like, 
go girl, that's awesome. But I'm just saying, so that's a great example of, to me, how I've been conditioned to think that's annoying. Why are you tapping the pen here while you're beside me? But maybe the tapping the pen is like, they're happy. They're just they're beating up. They have a high level of energy. Their energy is high and you know, they're tapping the pen and I'm like, just stop doing that. That's so annoying. Or I don't say that. I'm just in my head, like going, you know, this lady's whistling that me. I mean, she's probably happy. She's just like, mm -hmm. as if she was jumping and kicking her heels together. Why am I curmudgeoning on that? But my, and I don't do it out loud. I don't say it to the person, but the point is I should like, I don't. Well, it doesn't matter. Cause you're feeling it, Corey, like that. I mean, something in it's, it's bringing up the irritation with that's already in you. So something about that, like, that's how, you know, that's where we, I would go. Yeah. And so I'm curious, let's use that as an example. Cause that's what I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask like, what is, so from a personal standpoint, we're going to, I'm going to get a little personal right now. What is, what are, what's one of the biggest beliefs maybe that you carried that you recognized that you were able to set free, so to speak, that freed you in a way, like one of the, I like the game changing, like there's game changing beliefs that we acquire mm -hmm. that keep us stuck. And then there's these game changing beliefs that once we recognize them and I use EFT in my flipper script coaching, but as the release, you know, like the deleting of the files, um, I guess for you personally, and it, let's say I came to you or one of your clients came to you, knowing that happiness is a thing, but they are so not there. Mm -hmm. How, what would be what maybe one or two steps that you would take somebody mm -hmm. through just so we can get a sense of your approach? Yeah. In, in real time. <laughs> so I have like my top five steps to happiness that I believe allow you to, to connect and nurture all aspects of ourselves. So mm -hmm. I believe we're conditioned to focus on our physical, mental, and emotional selves, but not our spiritual self. And in our spiritual self is where our inner magic and superpowers lie. And that when we nurture that part of ourselves and we make time to connect to that part of ourselves, then that feeling of there's something missing in my life. There's a void. And I don't understand that like my life, for example, checks off all the boxes that society, culture, religion, family tell you that you should achieve to have a happy life. That me approaching 40, you know, fulfilling career, check. Um, healthy family, check. Our own home, check. Cars in the driveway, check. Vacations a year, check. Lots of beautiful material things. Like a very beautiful, blessed life. How is it that I was still feeling like I was never enough, that something was missing, that I needed to be more than who I was, that I wasn't happy and I wasn't fulfilled with my life. Like it just didn't make any sense to me. And I suffered in silence for a long time, not talking to anybody about it because it's like, Teresa, what do you have to complain about? You have like this beautiful, blessed life. So this is why it didn't make any sense to me. And it was because I wasn't connecting to the spiritual part of myself that until I focused on going inward and spent time on connecting to that part of myself versus the external that we're conditioned to look outside of ourselves for happiness in our mm -hmm. possessions, in our positions, our titles, degrees, relationships. I won't be happy until I find that perfect person. I won't be happy until I pay for my mortgage. I won't be happy until I go on vacation. I'll only be happy when I've achieved, you know, X, Y, and Z. That happiness is a, a state of arrival that I won't be happy until I reach a point. But right. happiness is who we are. Happiness is in the now. It's not in the future. And but we do that. We're we're always looking outside of ourselves. That we're like what you know, as a goal, even you ask people. What we're just want. talking about this yesterday. About like really all of us here today too. Like the reason what we're here or doing what we're doing is because we think we're going to feel a certain way when we like achieve it or when we help just mm -hmm. one more person help themselves or if we just do this or it's the feeling that we're going for. Ultimately, all this other stuff is just like, maybe my, is my feeling over here? It reminds me of the children's mm -hmm. book with a little duckling, I guess, was it a little duck? And it was, are you my mother? Are you my mother? Remember the mother went off to get the food and there was a little duck, eggs or was it chicken the egg hatched and the mother wasn't there and this little duck or chicken went all over like looking at like the dog and the horse are you my mother and i feel like that's what we do sometimes like mm -hmm. is this where my happiness is going to feel mm -hmm. like am i going to feel happy here will i feel happy when i get this yeah yeah so Not recognizing that it's inside you it's who you really are like this is why my message of happiness is very different in mm -hmm. that 
when you understand that happiness is at your core, it's your essential nature, you're no longer lo looking outside yourself. Right, you're just disconnected. I call it out of alignment from. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You're dis disconnected from the happiness that you are, from your essential nature, right? And it's only until we nurture that spiritual part of ourselves can we connect to that happiness that's there, unwavering, that we wake up happy every day, regardless of what our external environment is doing. I'm not dependent on, you know, whether this pandemic is over, whether we can take our masks off, whether I can go out and eat at restaurants. Like, I, I'm happy regardless of what's happening outside because, I'm not getting my happiness from there. It's me making time to connect to the happiness that's inside of me. And so knowing what those principles and practices are that can help you to do that. So EFT was one of the practices that I used to help to, to forgive, right? Forgiveness is a huge. Um, self first, tool. right, girl? It's yeah, the forgiveness absolutely. of the self. Everything yes. else just falls away once that's nailed it. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness is that if we're stuck in the past and not forgiving circumstances and people, then that we can't feel the happiness we can feel in the present moment. So when you said about looking in all these different places for happiness, where it's inside you. So all you and if you're not feeling it, as you said, you're not in alignment. So I know now because I've been working on myself for like oh, almost 10 years now is that as soon as I don't feel like myself, I don't feel the happy person that I am or the peaceful person that I am. I know that I need to take out, you know, my different tools that can help to remove the blocks to me feeling that. So meditation is a tool that I use every day to to go inward and to uh, and center and to connect with the love that's inside of me so to go back to your question about you know what um what was that key i think you said what was that key thing that that you realized is that i wasn't loving myself mm -hmm. at all the way that i needed to i was looking outside myself for love my entire life from my parents from my from um, my partner from my children from my friends from my co-workers from whatever looking for that love that acceptance that validation that status that all of that and i was doing that not recognizing that it was inside me all along looking in all the wrong places yeah don't we? Hello, right? Right? it's like, like right the there song. what if, this, if it was a snake it would have bit you <laughs> right the song looking for love in all the wrong places mm -hmm. it's inside you and when i connected through meditate that was i believe meditation is that gateway practice that helps you to connect with that totally. part of i've been doing i was i joe just spent joe and i've been hanging out every day for like yes. a while now his meditations are incredible and you talked about this space right like having this space and that's very much Joe Dispenda's approach in meditation is that we have a space, like we're just taking up this space. And what you're saying is that the space that we have is actually the happiness that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's in there. It's all that space with the nothingness that's, that we fill with all these old beliefs and all of these thoughts and all of these not enoughness and like just it's we're full. It's like the cup we talk about, like when all this comes up, it's already up in the cup right? It's already in us. So the frustration, the anger, the disappointment, the I'm not enough, the when we're feeling it and somebody, something is triggering it, it's because we have it. It's not like we catch it. It's not like they gave it to us. So <laughs> Here, I'm going to give you the anger. I'm so going to give a, you the insecurity. No, it's already there. So we have a question from a viewer that I want to make sure we get in um, that is right around the same topic. But also when we talk about timely, it's kind of interesting because this is what came up on my Facebook page today that I saved that I'm going to repost. Yes, wait exactly. all week for Friday, all year for summer, and all life for happiness. I but hate this, that. <laughs> but that's exactly what this is what people believe. That but that's, that's it's so funny that this is it's ironic to me that we this is what we've been talking about. And that quote I shared obviously a year or two years, some point and on the annual a while ago. But it's true, isn't it? Corey, happiness is in the now. It's in the present moment. This, that's where happiness resides. It's not on the Friday. It's not on the vacation. It's being present to your life. That's why mindfulness is one of the things that I that I practice like all day long is being mindful is, you know, what am I appreciating what I'm putting into my mouth? 
appreciating like what I see what's coming eyes. out of our mouth <laughs> and like and being here like here in this present moment right is that really being present and feeling the emotions that the present moment is giving you and when you are present that's where your happiness is because you're not stuck in the past and you're not and you're not also projecting the future right that a lot of anxiety is found in the future lots of anxiety in the future and then a lot of like depression found in the past and so it's here right now in the presence of like you two beautiful people having this incredible discussion and, and whoever's listening virtually is that this is where the this is where the joy and happiness is. The well, present and, and that, is the, one of the mind, one of our mind seats. I have a 21 day mind seed experience that go with the flip your script bands that I created. And they're seeds of thought that you can replant when you're having a thought that you don't want to grow your life into. You take the band, you flip it to the other wrist and you plant a mind seed. And one of the mind seeds, one of the daily mind seeds is the present is in the present. Mm -hmm. Like the present is really the gift. The yes. present is in the present. Mm -hmm. and well, and that's exactly what you're saying the present is in the present again and, simple but not always easy no and that, that quote <laughs> by the way i was looking i was curious it was seven years ago i shared it, it it's not my quote by the way it was just a quote that i saw and, and i just put uh is this you should we work on this and i didn't mean like me work on it with them i just but it, it makes me think of one other quote and then i want to make sure i put this question up too um and it's not meant to be a crude quote i didn't take it that way but um michael j fox i heard him in an interview one day and they said, what are your, what's your thought? Because, of course, I mean, the guy has had Parkinson's since he's been, what, like late 20s? And, I mean, I don't know if many people would have the same outlook he has on life. I mean, this guy, he told this great story on Ellen one time. He said his kids used to come up to him and say, Dad, and they complain about this and that. And his response was always he saw this lady had a, a, a baby in a tree. And he said, a woman had a baby in a tree. What do you got? And he was always like, you know, what do you got compared to a woman having a baby in a tree? But I always thought it was more profound, the fact that he didn't say, I've had Parkinson's for 30 years. What do you got? Mm -hmm. Like, he still wasn't making it about himself. He was still like, you know, that like you, you're you complaining because your cell phone's not working. This lady had a baby in a tree. It was, it's just reframing, right? But what mm -hmm. he said, which this quote I heard him say, which I thought was so profound about this topic, because they said, how can you not be worried about the future? You know, how can you not be thinking about the past you had as this big Hollywood celebrity? And he said, well, my view is when you have one foot in tomorrow and one foot in yesterday, you're peeing all over today. <laughs> and, you know, not meant to be crude. It's just it's true. Like when you think about when you're stuck in the past and the future, you're ruining and you're losing today. And I just I mean, I love his perspective on things. So I just that was something I had to share. And just to piggyback on that, our our future happiness is based on the happiness we feel in the present moment. So the greatest descriptor of like how happy will we be in the future is how happy we are right now. So again, people think that happiness is going to be in the future when you achieve, when you go, when you whatever. Well, you're when you it's not going to happen because you weren't happy every day leading up to that right. point. Because so how happy you are right now will determine what your future happiness, how happy you will be in the future. And, I'll, you know, and I'll add on. Well, life is a series of nows. Right. Mm -hmm. And if this is what now feels like, your life is just a series of every single now that is like now yeah. and now and yeah. now. Yeah. So yeah. when I'm having a moment, I always break it down. I'm like, I don't have to do big picture. This is now I'm creating my future right now because life is all life is, mm -hmm. is a series of nows. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it makes it so much more like, OK, I could do that. Yeah. OK, yeah. so this is what now feels like checking in. Right. And mm -hmm. life is a series of nows. And if we could just take that just one now at a time, you will yes. create your memories or your past and it'll be great. You could like relish in your past. You could mm -hmm. bring up emotions and feelings that keep you in high vibration just by, you know, paying mm -hmm. attention to each now yes. that we create. Yes. yes. And going back to Len, your initial um, question about mindset, right? Is that if you are present, then you're more apt to catch those thoughts about yourself or about the people around you, the circumstances that aren't serving you because you're present and you're in tune with it instead of, you know, being distracted by your phone or watching TV or, or, you know, all the other ways that we distract ourselves from being in the now and being present to what's happening. So that also helps us to, to be able to change some of the things that aren't serving us.
Absolutely. But if you do like a good Netflix binge, enjoy it while you're watching it. Because yeah. if you're feeling guilty, you're not really appreciating the now. No, no. no. And, 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 be, and appreciate what that activity is providing you with, right? That, that maybe you're not thinking about the past or the future when you're not right. locked in, in what, and you are feeling that peace in that moment. Like it is for me, it is also, I don't do, I don't watch a lot of TV, but sometimes I feel like I need to distract myself from like thinking, because my mind is, always, our minds are always going 60 to 70,000 mm -hmm. thoughts. Our mind is constantly going and it's designed to do that. Like it's an amazing organ that's keeping us alive all the time. Even when we're asleep, it's keeping us alive. It really is something that we wouldn't want to, to turn off. But sometimes when we're feeling like we just need to, meditation does that for me. If I'm going to choose between TV or meditation, I'm going to choose meditation. But sometimes you want the entertainment factor, right? And so I'm a big binger. I'll be the first to admit it. I mean, I get a lot done. I make a lot of changes, but sometimes I just... I like the no brainers, you know, and actually sometimes you do. I mean, I'm just giving people permission to find what brings them peace and happiness yes. because it's yes. different. It looks different yes. for everyone. Everybody. Right. And, what so. that, and why that activity, we should not feel guilty about it because what that activity is doing is remo removing the block to feeling the love, peace and happiness that we are. That's what it's doing. So, Right. You know, reading books does that for me. Listening to podcasts does that for me. Exercise does that. Cooking, being out in nature, like knowing what those activities are that help you to be in the present moment, to reconnect with the happiness that's inside you. So I want to I want to um, say something really important is that people think it's the activities that are giving them the happiness that, oh, I feel happy when I ride my bike. I feel happy when I'm painting. I feel happy when I'm walking my dog. I feel happy when I'm with friends. You're feeling happy, but not because the activity is giving you the happiness. You're feeling happy because it's removing the block, the blocks that you have from feeling the happiness that's always there. So people think they have to like, also dedicate time to these to like doing the activities that they like the activities are great and we should know what those activities are because like i said they allow us to reconnect it with the happiness that's inside us all the time so when the activity isn't there can you still feel happy yeah and the pandemic has been about that when restrictions have been placed upon activities that gave us happiness before. Can we still feel happy when we're not participating in those activities? Yes, we can. And if you're not feeling the happiness, then you need to make time to reconnect with the happiness that's inside you because it is your essential nature. Like this is like light bulb, like fireworks, like this is like this is right. what it is. <laughs> exactly you're so so on point like wh what and i believe we give ourselves permission like okay so when i ride my bike i'm giving somehow somehow some way i'm unlocking the door or the key or yeah. whatever's holding me from connecting to that in that activity and so what's holding you like why do you have the key why aren't you like sharing the key with your happiness when you're doing something else so I just resonate. I think it's beautiful that you're that you're sharing this with individuals who are so ready to connect with the happiness that's already within them. It's it's so important. And I love your approach. I love your light and your vibe. So you're you're the perfect representative of happiness. You're like, it's Thank working. Thank you. Well, Thank you. And I, I want to um there's a question here. I hope you guys can see it. It's, in the a, screen. Lot of, it's a couple of questions. Yeah, that's why well, right. it's all related. It's all I think it's all circled into one question. Um but I'll let you tack, read this and then tackle this, Teresa. And then we'll ask, of course, how we can learn more because I know our next guest is in the back stage area. But let's tackle this question before. Well, if you're, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you approach that. So I, I have, I have learned that the, if you can separate your, your spiritual self from your physical self. So I believe I'm a spiritual being having a human experience that my spirit is in a human body, making its way through the world as a human being participating in like in the world, doing what I, what I'm doing. I came down here to experience this. Like my soul wanted to learn, grow and expand by going through different experiences here on the earth plane. And so 
I have, I have been told um, that our spirit doesn't come into the body itself till the moment of birth. So even if the physical shell would have gone through some kind of trauma, but I'm not sh the spirit part of us is not in the physical part of us, like it in the womb. So I don't know what kind of trauma she might be referring to because technically the, the, the spirit is not really in, is not in the physical part of us at that point. It's then as soon as we're born, does the soul enter the body and then become that part of that physical form that's then making its way. Um, so she has a follow up to that. Forceps. Was a forceps birth. But again, if you can separate your the spirit part of you, which is the infinite, immortal, eternal part of you, that even once your shell is gone, that that continue, that returns back to like wherever it, wherever it came from, and then will maybe choose to come and reincarnate another time and have another human experience. Is that you are not like that even that forcept birth. You're not even the trauma of the physical body. We're not that. We are always whole and perfect. And we, even when we experience hardship, the soul just wanted that learning experience. It's all about the learning. If it's not, if we can also like, instead of saying, why did this happen to me? Is that why did it happen for you? That your spirit, your soul wanted to have this experience to learn from it. And it's important that we can that we can find the learning and appreciate the learning that gratitude is not only about being thankful for all the good things in our life, but also being thankful for the challenges and hardships because we can find the learning in that experience. So even if there was trauma, what learning did it provide you with? And if you well, are holding on to it and what is there's learning that, that you need, that maybe you haven't like tapped into that you need to find so that you can then feel gratitude for the experience and what that experience provided your soul because your soul is here to learn, grow and expand. So it's always, it's always about the learning. I don't know if that, if, if that answered her question. Uh, it answered it answered it from my perspective, but of course we can let her know if it answered it. And it depends on what's coming up for her right now. Like, mm -hmm. how is she feeling challenged and things like that? I mean, I would say if somebody ex goes through and experiences something traumatic and is here right now, I'm saying badass, right? Like you made it through. Like you're like a little mm -hmm. nugget, yeah. like a little nugget, and you made it through like that. Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, that's huge that you've come through mm -hmm. and you're here. For both, um, for both. It said, who is the learning for? For both. It's because yeah, yeah. on a soul level, both of them like decided that they would have this experience together for the learning that it provides, like all the parties for both. Yeah, and I think, and I think, well, I'm I'm just guessing here, but I think George was kind of also pointing out it may not have even been about your learning. Like, you know, I, I mean, obviously in this case it was for both. Yes, but I but we're ob obviously always looking at it like what did I go through? Right. But the mother also went through it as well. Yes, yes. And we and we play roles for each other, right? That as as mm -hmm. souls in physical bodies, we set up, it's like a play. We set up to play certain roles in each other's life so that, like for example, with me and my partner, he played a certain role so that I could come to a place that I, I now honor, uh, sorry, love, honor, and respect myself. Um, where he played a certain role that brought me to that realization that I wasn't respecting and honoring myself because I was allowing him to say and do things to me. And I wasn't using my voice to say that, you know, your behavior or what you're saying is not a loving response or, or, or a respectful response or whatnot. And so he played that role so that I could have that learning. So yes, we play roles in each other's life so that that learning can be facilitated for all of us. Amazing. So Teresa, I know uh, we're, we're a little past the wire. I won't say we're down to the wire. So right at the end here, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, this has been amazing to be continued because truthfully, I, I could keep this conversation going for hours. So, but Teresa, I wanted to know for those that have been listening that want to know what the next step is, and that could be working with you, that could be learning from you, whatever that looks like. Can you tell us where is there a hub or where would you send people who want to learn more? 
So they can definitely go to my website, which is teresagreco.ca. So I have all my services that I'm involved with are all there on my website. You can connect with me. I'm very active on Instagram, which is Teresa Greco underscore steps to true happiness. I'm on Facebook at steps to true happiness with Teresa Greco. I'm also um, by email steps to true happiness at gmail.com. And I think I got them all. Okay, awesome. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, like I said, to be continued with your permission, because this has been such a great conversation. <laughs> you can see, we started getting people jazzed up to talk about this further. So I feel like we, and maybe at least when you start, uh, if you start and when you start the Flip Your Script Fridays back again, maybe this would be a really will, good they're point. coming. Absolutely. I, I would love we to have you on Flip Your Script Friday. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I would yeah, love so that. Let's, Let's facilitate that in the future as well. So, Definitely. Lisa, uh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you. I honor you. I salute you. And we'll wave the flag for you. Keep on doing the great thing. <laughs> thank you so nice much. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. So we'll send uh, Teresa backstage. Going to bring on our final guest for the day. Last but not least, as they say. And uh, Sylvia, so excited to have you here today. And... Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but where we normally start is we get the guests to tell us a little bit about themselves before we dive in further. And you have a really unique story in terms of, and at least I don't know if you saw this in when you and I were chatting, but the book that she wrote and the experience she had, I'm super excited to dive into it. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Sylvia, just before we kick things off for those that may be discovering you for the first time today? Uh, sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. Well, Good afternoon in my time. Oh, that's <laughs> right. It's morning for uh, Sylvia, afternoon for Elise. Where are you? I'm I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, you're in the States. My yes, name yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I used to live in San Francisco on the corner of Fulton and Stanion, right by Golden Gate Park. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's a great area. I'm just north of Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous here today. So, uh, yeah, fall's, fall's my favorite. One, well, it's hard to pick, but it's always beautiful in the fall. But it's beautiful all over the world just about in the fall in my, my uh, experience. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I'm a writer. And um, I don't know. Well, I can even just show you here. Here's the book. <laughs> Two breaths, one step. And it's an adventure memoir. Hi um, a fabulous experience hiking over 500 miles across the Himalayas up to over 18,000 feet. It was an adventure I took uh, years ago, and I was motivated to write about it a couple of years ago. The book was recently published. It's filled with amazing stories through a very captivating landscape, uh, breathtakingly beautiful. There's pictures in there, uh, 16 pages of full color photos. And it, it's got a number of themes woven through it in terms of, uh, it's, a, it's a quick read, but it's uh, it's a day-to-day -day hiking adventure, and underneath it, it's got the theme of the, the Buddhist culture, which is extremely prominent in that area of the world, and um, some just many different threads woven together, and it, it's a fun book. Awesome. Okay, so I so I just want to set the scene. So how <laughs> long ago, what age were you when you took this journey? Right, right. Good question. So I was, uh, I had my 29th birthday on this journey and it was okay. in the mid eighties. And as uh, we all know, the world was a very different place in the mid eighties. So, uh, you know, you're not, you're not having your cell phone with you. And <laughs> I know, you know, my friends and I hitchhiked and I keep in touch with her. We've been friends since we've been 15. We hitchhiked through Europe and we're like, how did we even do that? Like, we were like, we'll meet you here. I'll meet you in Marseille. I'll meet you on Crete. Like, how did we even like find each other? I know, yeah. And let alone, <laughs> you know, you just showed up and found a place to stay. And yeah, I mean, things worked. And in some ways it was a lot less complicated. <laughs> I guess so. Like it did work. I remember the adventures being amazing, but you're right. And it was like the end of the, like end of the eighties, early nineties, same time, no yeah. cell phones. And yeah. we ended up meeting up and finding each other and having the adventure and finding the youth hostel to stay in. And that's it. Yeah. The great youth hostels. Yeah. This was, this was extremely remote. And I remember it really hit me about 10 days into my hiking. I, uh, you know, was in the, and the, and you got to understand, and this is the mid eighties at that time, Nepal, which is the country I was doing the hiking in, um, had the fewest roads of any country in the world per capita. 
And so what you did is you just hopped on the local bus and you took it as far as it went. And then you got off and you started walking. Everybody walks if you want to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, months later when I came back that way, you know, they'd added one more mile to the road. <laughs> did you go alone on this journey? Well, you have to read the book. Uh, technically, I was with three other people. Uh, and then Sherpas, you, you just don't go by yourself. Right, it's a completely, right. completely different hiking experience than here. But for all practical purposes, I was alone because these people were rarely in my sight. I mean, I tried to prepare for this trip. But um, just to give you an idea, um, there's a saying that when you hike to, for example, Everest Base Camp, which is 18,000 feet, you have to actually climb 25,000 feet and descend 35,000. In other words, the terrain is like this. It's not like the Sierras in, in or the Appalachians on the East Coast where you pretty much go up one side, there's a crust and you go down the other. The uh, mountain ranges in the United States are very linear. They're, they're very north-south oriented. And where I'm at, uh, one of my favorite places in the, in the world is hiking the Eastern Sierras. And you can get up to the crest and stand there and look out east and you can look out west. Well, the Himalayas are nothing like that. You get up and you just see this unending sea of mountains, many over 26,000 feet. So I was uh, constantly exhausted. But anyway, I just, I just was not, uh, I mean, I thought I was in good shape. But anyway, they were always miles ahead of me, which is why um, there's a moving um, um, passage in the book. And also in my story, which is the the, um, the mountains, my teacher, which is in the book uh, being published this winter, that um, I got lost in a blizzard at 16,000 feet because I was alone and it was freezing and I couldn't see anything. And that, that was a horrendous experience in the book. So technically I was with others, but I always kind of say I was alone because... I was always the last one strangled it, you know, straggling into camp. And half the time I was so exhausted, I just went to bed and couldn't even eat. <laughs> and then you hit the replay button the next day. But for those of you that are not backpackers, I mean, there's a certain element in the mundane where you're just thinking about putting one foot in front of the other and, you know, what you're going to do for water and dinner and I mean, it's really fantastic. You are not worried about all these existential things that some people like myself might be thinking about on a day to day, you know, in your home. Yeah. I mean, I always think that I like hiking and I've joined like meetup hiking groups and then we get there and I'm like, you know what? The idea of this is way better than the thing itself for me. <laughs> when I do my I'm talk. like, thank God the brewery's at the end of this 12 yeah. mile hike. <laughs> when I do my talks around the country, I always say, uh, you know, you can enjoy this wonderful adventure and you don't even have to put your hiking boots on. You can right. just, just read my book. You exactly, like you're there. Exactly. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people uh, I was at this one event and this woman came up to me after. And, um, you know, people ask very uh, kind of day to day, you know, like, what did you do for food or what did you eat? And she had just returned from hiking like hut to hut in um, Italy. And so she was asking me about food and she was telling me how, you know, She'd get into these little and huts in Italy. I just came back from a couple of weeks hiking in northern Italy in the Dolomites, and the Italians decide what hike to do based on the menu. At okay, the well, hut. I could do that. I would totally yeah. do that. <laughs> and it, we, we don't even have huts here, food, let alone coffee. Well, they have like gourmet food. Okay, and so I'm she was telling me she'd, you know, roll in and, you know, it's like cheese platters and tiramisu. And I'm like, you definitely do not want to do what I do. <laughs> I want to find out what, what hike that was. That sounds like my kind of hike. I'll hike oh, from was. house to house and eat at their din dining room table with them yeah, outside yeah, in I'm their older. vineyard. Yeah, I'm older now, but I, I could have stayed easily uh, three times as long. I'd go there in a heartbeat. It was fantastic. So where did you, wait, so we just came back. Yeah, I did just a couple months ago. It was fantastic. I was the first, apparently the first airplane uh, American going there, and they didn't have any booked for the rest of the summer. This was uh, first end of uh, June, 1st of July. And it was, it was just, it was like a fantasy land. Okay. Well, I'm going to reach out and I'd like to learn more because I definitely, you know, if I'm going to hike and do something that's, and I like that, I like that it's a different way of experiencing a different culture and environment. 
right? Like how many people go on a hike from like house to house and, you know, yeah, with I, families. Yeah, it's very different. I, I must, you know, hands down, they're they're far more sophisticated than we are. <laughs> that's amazing. So, was, but that's the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, you, you can go anywhere in between. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm frankly, yeah, it's, it was an amazing adventure. I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it, it was, you know, it was, it was very difficult, but it was breathtakingly beautiful. And I'm someone that is uh, one of my main themes in my life has always been beauty. It's what motivates me. It was, it's what inspires me. Uh, the other being truth. And those two values are, um, well, you can find them anywhere, but the Himalayas have this, uh, just this incredible tradition and really a mystique about them. I mean, they're mountains, but they're like the mother mountain. <laughs> Is it something that as a kid you were intrigued by because you read something in a book or saw a movie or like, it's not like, it, you know, it's, you yeah. don't always hear, oh, I, you know, went and hiked the Himalayas. Right, right. I talk about this a little bit in the book for whatever reason. I don't know if everyone's like this, but for me, um, words speak to me. And re I've always loved geography. And w w I grew up in an, uh, in our home, we are often had people coming and going from around the world. And my mother was just passionate about travel, even though she had five kids and was not globe trotting around the world. But that was that was go. That's probably what kept her alive in terms of her <laughs> imagination. But um, I just uh, so anyway, words words just speak to me. And, uh, you know, Gosh, somewhere back there in my early 20s, I, I heard, well, actually in the 70s, the, the kind of hippie trip was to go from Istanbul to Kathmandu or Afghanistan. That was, um, I, as I said, I was more like 29. Uh, the name Kathmandu just, you know, places just speak to me. Like when I was actually hiking, there's a place, and remember this is the, the mid 80s, there was a place called Gokio. Now, I knew nothing about this place other than seeing it on a map, but it just spoke to me. And I I just uh, told the guide one day, I'm, I'm going over there, and that was going to require a detour of a couple of weeks. And uh, I was just going to go on my own because it wasn't part of our plan. But anyway, I, I guess what I'm just saying is places just speak to me. And mm -hmm. um, the, as I said, the Himalayas, well, you know, the mountains have always, I'm a mountain gal. I mean, I love the coast, but I breathe. Uh, my breathing just excels when I'm above 10,000 feet. <laughs> wow. I always say I could be blindfolded and I would know when I pass uh, 10,000 feet. The air is just, it's just hey, different. Marnie. What? Uh, you have, we have a question if you be up. Oh, yeah. I think she's in St. Croix, if I'm, if I'm, if I remember correctly. Oh, hey, my friend Marnie. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie's a fellow writer. Yes, I'm going to uh, spend some time with her in late November, of course. Although, is that in St. Croix? Yeah, in St. Mm -hmm. Croix. Although, just, you know, I'm not, I, yeah, you know, I'm a mountain gal, but, and I'm not a super humid uh, person with high humidity, but hey, I love exploring. So, you, uh, any, anything, I'm game for anything. Maybe we'll meet there. I just, I've just got a, a message from a friend who's actually a tugboat captain over in St. Croix and has been for years, Ingo Schluter. So I'm not sure, Marnie, if you know him. Um, and we've been friends forever. And I lived in the Caribbean for years in the British and, Vir and U.S. Virgin Islands as a private charter chef. And I sailed the leewards and, and all over after a uh, long story, but after being paralyzed with a autoimmune disease, I decided to start taking the journey of life. And so the Caribbean is amazing, but I would never think to hike on the island. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I haven't been there, but Marty could tell, I mean, like Hawaii, there's fantastic hiking. I, I don't, I've never been to, I've never been to, been to the Caribbean, but nowhere near St. Croix. St. Croix is bigger, is a much bigger island than the smaller island. So there's probably right. a lot more terrain and a lot more to see and a lot more to do for right. sure. I met Marnie on a fantastic adventure uh, skiing in Utah for several years. Wow. Just but like anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Marnie. Well, I mean, there's there's such a great lesson in all of this. Uh, when we talk about what we were talking about earlier, about living in the moment, mm -hmm. it seems clearly uh, you understand the power of now, especially when you're on the, and I, I mean, like you said, your day-to-day -day life might be a bit different, but when you're on these journeys and you talked about like, I'm thinking about, well, 
you know, what am I going to eat later? <laughs> like, you're, I mean, even if that's later, you're still in the minute because it's only, we're only right. talking a little bit later and you're actually thinking about it now. Like, okay, what do I plan for that? So it feels like you're truly living in the now when you go on these adventures. Is that, is that a safe assessment? Yeah, you have that perfectly. And it's, it's actually why I love sports so much. Like I'm a passionate skier and, Frankly, I, I don't do well with just like, I'm not a kind of person that's going to just hang on a beach all day. I, I, frankly, I'd find that very stressful. I do much better when my mind's occupied. So it is not available to go off. And, you know, as I always say, the it's like your mind's like the puppy. It's always running off and it's, it's not in the present. So that's why I love skiing, because the moment I'm not present, I fall flat on my face. <laughs> so it just constantly brings me back. And, uh, Traveling does that. And it also, for whatever reason, the way I'm wired, it just helps me understand my world, my place in the world. And I can just see so much clearer. Um, it just really, um, it helps. And it, it helps me to understand my world. I hear you, girl. I'm, I always say my home to me is when I'm out on the road when I'm experiencing, you know, new things and new places. That's where I feel at home. Having a nice home, having a beautiful retreat, living in the Wikiwachi in the beautiful springs is beautiful, but I'm on a month long journey right now in my RV, traveling, visiting friends and family. I don't need to be on a mountaintop. I could be driveway surfing, which is my favorite thing to do, but I have a new e-bike and I get to travel into the towns and I go into the neighborhoods and to me, that's home. Like it's amazing. So I understand you're a little bit more extreme in your journey. I don't know if I would like <laughs> take off to the Himalayas, um, but there is something refreshing and freeing. And I feel feeling safe. I don't know if, if if you feel the same way, but there's a safety that I feel when I'm out in the world. Yeah, and you know, I just heard an interview from. I, I'm going to do an interview with Rick Steves. Probably on. Uh, anyway, I just heard it, Rick Steves do an interview with the New Yorker, and he people were asking him about um, just you know he lives in a small town, and, and I, I, he expressed exactly what I've always felt that, that I, I'm very stable when I'm at home, and it's it's very helpful for me to have a rootedness, but and that's how I grew up with that but that gives me the psychic space and availability to go wander wherever because mm -hmm. I, I, some people can just wander endlessly, but I, I do need a sense of uh, rootedness in my, I, I really um, thrive on that sense of rootedness in a community. So yes, I love going out like you're doing, but I, um, my creativity is nurtured by having a, a kind of a place to come, to retreat back to. Oh, well, yeah, we have a retreat that we retreat back to that we started in Wikiwachi, Florida. So it's there. So it is nice, yes, to have that base, some place to pull into and, 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 you know, be grounded. Although I find the creativity comes from being in the world. Like to me, that is that place. And it doesn't yes. even feel like wandering. It just feels like no, home, you're know? absolutely right. And that's certainly where my ideas come from um, to generate. I also have a career as a fine artist, a painter. And uh, I thrive on having a place to develop the project, so to speak. But the idea, for example, of, of this book, uh, Two Breaths, One Step, I mean, frankly, it was an incredible gift. I didn't just go, oh, I'm just gonna sit down and write about this experience I had 30 years ago. I, I was actually um, very fortunate and got to spend a month hiking in Patagonia, which is wow. an amazing area of the world. Now, the mountains there, they're not near the the height of the Himalayas, but they're very, very striking. And I I don't know if it was just the routine of hiking every day and the air and the, the smells. I found myself thinking a lot about the Himalayas, which you know I don't think about on a daily basis. Right. And um, I just was just so inspired and I just started writing and I was not thinking about a book. I It's a skill I transferred over from um, painting. When I'm in the studio, I am definitely not thinking about what gallery this painting's going to and who's gonna purchase it or, or where it's going. I'm not thinking at all about that. And when I was writing, I was not thinking about a book or any of that because I knew it would just kill my project. <laughs> I just started writing and next thing I knew I, I had a book and it was like, wow, 
but it, it was really grace is what I say. But anyway, the idea came to me, uh, just like you said, when I'm mm. out. And that's when I have, I, I do not have my best idea sitting at the desk. I know, and right? Now, is that painting talk, behind you something that, you, uh, is that your work behind you? Uh, well, uh, th this is a painting from a long time ago, yes. Uh, but And it's, this is a map of the world I have. Uh, I was going to be like, yeah. I know you can't see it very well, but there's little pins. Well, there's pins for every place I went, and then there's pins play, pe placed in certain areas. And then I have like an old-fashioned Polaroid camera of me with, you know, a gorilla in Uganda or whatever it is. Oh, nice. And yeah, yeah. So they're just, it, may, it makes the map come alive. And I um, also have another career working with students and my life's all about learning, which is what I, I don't like being bored. I, like, as I say, I'm the a really joy good joy of learning behind. You. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a really good skier, but I, I love having a coach because, you know, there's always more to learn and I just always want to want to be learning more. Other, otherwise I just would get bored. So um, yeah, people anyway. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, I love adventures and, uh, yeah, I love. Uh, I love. So you the said mountain. you were going to be on the podcast and speaking, and so is it the story that you tell? As, it, like, when if I if I was to come to see you on stage, what would how would I what would I expect? Like, what stories would you share or motivation? Well, um, when the book came out, I I did um, gosh over thirty appearances at um, a lot of them um, out west. I'm not sure if they're back east or not. We have an outdoor store called REI. Uh, at least. Uh, oh yeah. A yeah. sports store. Yeah, is that in the East Coast? Well, I travel in RV a lot. I don't know where I saw it, but they're all. Uh, <laughs> I've seen them all over REI. Anyway, um, I did. I did presentations at all eleven of the Bay Area REIs, and then I was also in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. So those were particular book events when my book came out, and um, actually, it's in great company. I think, um, and I it debuted at uh, one of the um, most well-known bookstores. Um, in the country near where I live. And it's where, you know, like if the president writes a book, that's where they speak. So I was in, I remember the day I was going to be there, uh, Michelle Obama's book had just come out and I loved it on the counter. It was my book. I was speaking and her book was right next to it. <laughs> How awesome is that? It was, it was good. I, I sent a picture to my publisher and said, Hey, I'm in real good company. And the same thing happened when Tom Hanks wrote his uh, book of short stories. It just came out when he grew up uh, fairly near here and the local bookstore in the town he grew up in had it featured right there and I was speaking there and um, it was it was right there on the shelf next to him. So I kind of got a kick out of that. But uh, anyway, so I usually do a very short reading from the book and um, well, to begin with, I really like to engage the audience. So I always ask first if someone's been there uh, and if so, you know, was it last year or was it 30 years ago? And uh, I find out if anyone's interested in writing, if they're interested in any spiritual traditions, or if they're interested in the arts. So I try and understand who my audience is. And then I um, read a short excerpt and I talk about, I just talk about a variety of some of the adventures, you know, whether it was getting lost in the blizzard or whether it was meeting a llama in, um, in a very remote monastery. And, and then I, I always have questions and answers, which are, are just fascinating. Like the one I mentioned where the gala just returned from hiking in Italy with fantastic food. And uh, I said, she might not want the kind of trip I do <laughs> unless she went with a tour company that was real exclusive and they, and they do everything for you. I mean, it's a different world today. So you can definitely do that. Right. Right. I mean, also like when I did my adventure, I had a, um, or when I do these presentations, I have a fantastic slideshow. And one of the slides is um, the highest place where you could actually, let's say, set up a tent. It, it, I actually walked higher, but it was at uh, this, um, I think 18, 17,500 or something. But anyway, it was just, you know, I set up a tent and someone told me today there is a hotel there. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> so. Right. And also there was a, um, there's actually two treks I did um, that um, the first one, I had no intention of doing the second one, but the day I finished, uh, the day I was about to leave, uh, let's see, this was the prime minister and dear Gandhi was shot in India. It was kind of like 9-11 in the sense that no one was going anywhere, all airports, bus, everything was closed. 
So I just figured, what the heck, I'll, I'll go out again. Uh, <laughs> so I went out for another month. Um, but oh, not, not just like another five hour track, it was another month. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you can't just really, that's what I mean. There's no, you, you, yeah, I guess you could walk two and a half hours and two and a half hours back, but you, you had to walk everywhere. So yeah, it was it was to the mountain range and the uh, Western part of the country. But the point being, I, I just, I, in the research for this book, they had just completed, I believe in 2017 or maybe it was 18, they completed the, the road, the highway around this entire range of mountains. Uh, which I suppose is a, is a huge feat for the local people rather than walking for a month. But what that meant is that there were only like four days of this, oh, at least minimum three week, if not four week track where you're, where you're not within sight of a road, which is a vastly, vastly different experience. So, you know, there's certainly remote areas and uh, in fact, I had the real, I had a great privilege uh, right before COVID broke out. I had an opportunity to go to Tibet. And as I say, I got to see all my old friends, meaning all my buddies that are over 26,000 feet, my mount, the mountain range. And of course, they're still there. And I got to wave to all of them. And it was, uh, it was a very different experience, though, because I was coming in. I, I was not hiking for months. I was coming in through the north into um Everest, which is on the Chinese side, but it, it was great. To, it was, in fact, that was a fantastic story, you know, because I, I thought, you know, I, I could easily get sick. Um, altitude sickness is a real concern. At, at, uh, I was at 17,500. And from my understanding, it really doesn't have much to do at all with your physical condition. I mean, you could go once and be fine. And the next time you could get very ill. So, you know, I didn't know how my body was going to react. I hoped it'd be fine, but you know, I'm older. <laughs> So uh, I remember the last little village we were in, I had a guide and he go, he, he said, you know, you need to go in and get two bottles of oxygen, which of course, in the mid 80s, they did not have. And I said, really, do we really need to do this? We're at the average elevation in Tibet is 14,000, the average. So we're probably at 15 now. And uh, so he sends us into the store to buy the oxygen and I get my two bottles and I just become more and more alive the higher I go. So I was with a, a small group of friends and we finally get to where we're going and it was really late in the season. So the little tea house that was run by the monastery across the path uh, was already closed down and everything, uh, but we could, we could boil water. Anyway, so we get there and I'm just having the time of my life and I just think it's fantastic. Well, everyone else is just so miserable. They can't sleep. They're sick to their stomach. They have headaches and they're dying to get out of there. And I'm just like, are you kidding? Can we stay longer? Because we weren't up there very long that night and the next morning. And I, you know, then I just left and I, I gave my oxygen to the um, guide and said, you know, you can donate this to someone else. Because I, I hadn't opened it where everyone else didn't have any left. But, you know, I, I was lucky, I guess. Or, you know, it's not that I was any different or better than them. It's just... I just was thriving. My sister says I must have been a Sherpa in my last life. Could be. <laughs> so I, I would love to ask you, uh, Sylvia, as we start to wind down, what would you say is maybe your, I'm going to say, best life lesson or two that you learned personally from these treks and from uh, all these adventures? Like, is there something that stands out, one or two life lessons you learned during these journeys? <sighs> sure. Um are you, I don't know if somewhere you're going to put a plug in that people wrote a story in this book, because that's what my story in the book is about, that it's going to be published in a couple months or something. Yeah. And it's called, um, the story is uh, my The Mountains, My Teacher. And um, I think two things come to mind, and I, I talk about this in the story. Um, it's an overused word today, and it's hard to make sense of this unless you've been somewhere like this, but it's really the sense of gratitude. I mean, on several levels. One is just materially. I mean, I came home and I talk about this in the story. I mean, going into the grocery store was an incredibly disorienting experience just from the sheer volume of amount of food that was available to me and everything else. And 
or whether it was just, you know, going to the kitchen sink and being able to drink a glass of water, which today most of the world's population cannot do, we still cannot do, um, or turning on a light. I remember, and, and it just depends on your orientation. I remember um, when I uh, came back, uh, an acquaintance of mine was just about to leave for a year in India and Nepal. And he was so excited and I was so excited because I just returned. And um, it was so interesting. 30 days later, I'm walking around, I was in a small town then and I see him and I'm like, what, what, I thought you left. And he goes, yeah, I did. And I said, but you were gonna go for a year. And he goes, I couldn't stand it. I came home. And I'm like, what do you mean? Because I just was like, so, you know, up here. <laughs> like in nirvana i was just you know and he said well gosh you know there's and this is in the, the mid 80s but he goes you know there was just trash everywhere and the hygiene there's no hygiene there's um you know there's no uh, it's it's dirty it's not clean you can't drink the water there's no you know there's sewage place and i just listened to him and i thought you know he's right you know, you, you can't drink the water. It's, um, there's no personal hygiene. But when I was there, I mean, I saw all that. But what I really saw beyond that was these unbelievable mountain peaks and the sheer beauty of the landscape and the people, as poor as they were, not to, um, I don't know what the word is, fantasize about it, not that they're happy because they're poor, but just there was so much beauty. And he hadn't he hadn't seen that, or and I just thought, well, isn't that interesting that people can have the be the same place and the same, but yet have vastly different experiences. So one thing is the gratitude, and um, and I'm also it was it's also talked about in the story in the book. Uh, you can't help but notice the privilege. I mean, I experienced um, because of the color of my skin, uh, which. I don't think about, I mean, I'm thinking more and more about today, but I don't, at that time, I certainly did not think about every day in the United States in the, in the mid eighties and um, just the, the privilege and, and with privilege, I always think comes a tremendous responsibility, tremendous. I mean, it's very humbling. So I would say um, gratitude and just a, a patience. Oh my gosh, patience. <laughs> Patience. You just things are not happening on the time frame they do here, which on the other hand is incredibly relief, a relief. The rhythm it must of be life. like refreshing on some level. It is. I I mean I treasure a slower rhythm in life, which you really I find I really have to work hard to have that in my present world, just from even you know, 10, 20 years ago, it's vastly mm -hmm. different. And that's just um that pace, a slower pace works better for me in terms of absorbing, reflecting, and synthesizing things in my brain. I mean, my brain's really fast and sharp, but it's kind of on a different operating system. <laughs> it's a great way to explain it, right? I we think it's kind of ironic, too. Well, I think it's kind mean? of ironic, too, as well, Sylvia, that you said, you know, you, you, we almost have to work now to slow things down. <laughs> it's kind of ironic we have to, like, we work, work to get things slow now because, you know, the, the world around us is moving very fast. Yeah, and actually, yeah, I, I, yeah, I require it for me at least, I have to be extremely vigilant. I always say it's like a garden. If I don't attend to it, I have a garden full of weeds. If I don't tend to my life, I have a life full of constant interruptions, which do not uh, nurture creativity. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so uh, I wanted to ask you as well, uh, Sylvia, I mean, first of all, yes. Uh, so at least you might be wondering what uh, Sylvia was talking about as far as the uh, book. And so she is indeed in the next edition of the Blue Talks book series. And so we've been plugging that the last couple of days, uh, talking about it a bit. And as we get closer to the end of the week, we'll be talking about it more. We kind of build up a little bit there. But that's uh, what she's referring to for those listening. As far as her chapter coming out in the book, I'm really excited to read the story myself. We got it and I went through it. And then, I, I mean, now we're getting it ready for the editors. So I'm excited to like, hold. I mean, I'm always excited to hold the book in my hand and read the final story. 
you know, like just read it when it's fully done, you know, captured like this, you know, in the actual book form. And so I'm super stoked for that. But I wanted to ask you as well, for those that want to get your book that we've been talking about a lot today, even without saying the title over and over, we've been talking about it and the core <laughs> message in it. Uh, where can people get that? And is that the same hub you would send to people that want to learn more about you and connect with you further? So it really, it's just a where can people connect with you, learn more, grab the book, all that kind of good stuff. Well, in terms of grabbing the book, you can grab it anywhere. Um, the huge, the huge distributor we all know about, or your favorite bookstore down the street. So it's widely available. Uh, you can also go to its personal own website, and it's just two breaths, like breathing, two breaths one step.com and if you go on there you'll see a selection of photos also there's a selection of paintings in the book you can order it right there off that page if you want it makes no difference whatever's easiest for you um people can always reach me on that website they can reach me personally just shoot me an email sylvia varange at yahoo.com and um i think that answers your questions <laughs> <laughs> it does for sure. I just want to ask for the website to make sure I put it in right because I want to put it in the comments. It's two steps, one breath. But dot is com. it dot com? Is it is it the spelled out like two spelled out and one spelled out or the? Oh yeah, out? yes, it is two spelled out. And unlike the printed book, there is no comma after two breaths. It's just two breaths, one step, dot com. Okay, perfect. Awesome. I just wanted to make sure because I want to put it in the, like I say, in the comments here. So Elise, uh, you yes. you were really, uh, in a lot of ways, the uh, cheerleader for this and you've been steering most of the conversation. So I don't want to- Oh, I would totally go on a hike with you through Italy again or somewhere <laughs> else where we can eat our way through, like wherever the area is. Yep, it, let's, let's go. I would love to. Like one, one of my favorite things to do is to meet families in different you know locations and be invited, especially RVing. Uh, my fiance and I RV'd for almost a year and a half. We worked remotely. I coached remotely and was running the Flip Your Script platform and doing a lot of other events. And we met people on our journey. We only had two bicycles on the back. They weren't e-bikes at the time. And we had a 24-foot motor coach. And we would meet people at Franklin Hot Springs or wherever we were. And we'd be invited to come and either stay in their driveway or in their cul-de-sac. And it was so beautiful because we got to be in their home and I we, we called it kitchen takeovers. I'm a chef, so I have a culinary background. And we'd go in and we'd do that like breakfast takeover or take over the kitchen and just make meals and have everybody come together. And, and I love that, you know, or have them cook for us, their signature dishes or their traditional Sunday meals. And well, I can, see why so every, I, I can see why everybody loved having you over there. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, it doesn't matter whatever, whatever you have in your cupboards, just I'll make something. That's I'll great. When are you something. showing up? <laughs> You just, you know what? I'm serious. I'll be there, girl. My son's actually out in California. Well, he's out in Oregon now. He has a pleasure way RV and he started his journey during COVID. And he's been out in San Diego area and is making his way up with his girlfriend, to Oregon and Washington. And he'll be coming back down into South Dakota. I think he's doing a sugar beet harvest. But so he's experiencing the beauty of, of your, your coast right now. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot here in the United States that we could experience the last uh, the last year and a half. I mean, that trip to Italy, I must admit, I had great fun eating lots of tiramisu. <laughs> um, sure, I'm sure. Yes, one of my favorite things is taking the back roads to wherever I'm going. Just take the back roads because you never know what you find. No, Beautiful yeah. little nuggets, you know, that people don't see when you take the highway or the throughway or the parkway. Yeah, and you really hit that on the head. It's wonderful to do whatever people where you're doing, uh, what they do. I mean, I, I tra really try and travel pretty much under the radar. I mean, it's it's obvious you're an American. You can't really, well, it's, it's obvious I am. Uh, <laughs> you can't really get get around that. But um, but I I, t I t keep a very low profile. I mean, I I'm very conservative dressing. I, I just want to blend in. I uh, I just wanted, and I want to do the things the locals do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. That's what makes it so fun. I know. I know. We just met. We just met some oyster. I'm in Maine right now, actually. And I just met some oyster, local oyster farmers. There's the whole oyster farming initiative to save the marine life. And and I happened to be at a brewery, a local brewery, one of my favorite things to do and met. They had this like shuck wagon and they were shucking oysters. And I met the owner of the program, but also the owner of the oyster farm whose oysters I was indulging and in loving and so i was invited now to go out on their boat fantastic um and take a trip a day trip out and just experience you know their whole you know what do they do in their day in their life you know and their charter that they normally do but i was invited you know and those are the kind of things that i think make an impact and they make the world sweeter when we mm. get to meet and interact with people we recognize that this is this world globally is full of the most amazing beings, a kind, loving, caring, and giving. And the little 1% that we get to see or that we get fed on a daily basis is really the minority. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, like, you know, the great saints say we have so much in common, so much more in common than we have differences. It's really being able to see that. I think that, that, uh, well, it, it's actually very uh, peaceful to, to, to come to that place. And, and, and having experiences is really the one thing that changes people's lives is having a one-on-one -on -one experience. And that's the beauty of having really Manatee Landing Retreat, the retreat that we started in the middle of the pandemic, is that we, we are creating a destination for people to come and have experiences and meet new people in a climate-friendly environment because we're very outside and the suites are private, just to make a note of that. Um, but it's but it's life-changing because there's different cultures, right? And different backgrounds and different reasons why people show up. But when you when you have these meetings and the child, the family kids meet each other and they form these little groups and they make memories that last a lifetime, that's how we're gonna change the world. Right. You know, that's one, right. one interaction yeah. at a time. And the fact that you're going out in the world and creating that and sharing that is is a gift. Yeah, that's yeah. why I really support people traveling. And, and it could just be, you know, an hour from your house. I mean, it doesn't have to be to the other side of the world. It just has to be some place that gets you out of your routine. At least that's what it is for me. Yes. And my friends joke with me. They say, you know what, Elise, you could go to like a Publix or a, seven, or a Wawa and have a road trip, right? Like that to me is who knows who I'm going to meet in line or at the gas at the gas pump or, you know, walking into the store waiting for whatever, like everything is an adventure if you just go into it that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you don't have to hike the Himalayas, just read her no, book. <laughs> no, you definitely don't have to. You can, you can just go to your, you know, take a, take a road you haven't taken before. Right. And read your book and have, and you know, see it through your eyes, have that experience through your eyes. Well, it's been wonderful to get to share that with people. And I, uh, I love yeah, I love hearing the comments of people it, it, and hearing what it triggers in them. So often it triggers some memory that might, you know, they may not have been to this place at all, but just, you know, something in their childhood they remember or something. And um, I, I do flash back to some threads of my own childhood that uh, came up in that journey just for whatever reason because of my experiences. But, uh, but like I said, there's many themes woven through the book. So there's... Um, a lot of different avenues that someone could approach and enter. Yeah, and it might inspire them to take their own journey. Yes, yes. Which would be, you know, sweet. Yeah. All right, Corey, I know we've gone over, right? No, it's, bit, it's, it's all good. This has been magical. So I'm, I'm super stoked. And, uh, and I had ordered a copy of the book and it's on my shelf, like my bookshelf over here that I have to read it myself as well to live vicariously through you. Uh, so I'm excited about that because we have hiking boots, but, uh, I'm also okay with, you know, sitting with my feet up and reading the book and living your, you can read, you can read the book with your boots on <laughs> or, or go to, or go to the Publix with the book and read it sitting there at the food, like the food area they have in some of the Publix. And then you're double dipping, right? You're actually <laughs> going and having the adventure while having reading about the adventure. There, so, you, go. there you go. There you go. There you go. Where it keep you wherever you go and it becomes its own adventure. And you'll mm -hmm. probably, you'll probably have a, a more satisfying meal for yourself. Absolutely. 100%. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. I knew it would be. 
I thank you so much. I appreciate you. I salute you. I honor you. We're going to wave the flag for you in a big way uh, with the upcoming Blue Talks book. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Elise, for being here with me. I think I'm going to do the sign up for everybody at the same time, if that's cool, Elise. Absolutely. Um, I'm got, I've got 10 minutes, so I'm good. Okay, this has so, been so fun much reference. fun. We, well, we loved having We're going to stay in touch because I really am I'm, I'm interested and inspired to, to do a little Italian trip. <laughs> That sounds great. This has been so much fun to, to be with you two th today. Thank you. Well, we loved Thank it. You. And we always call it a to be continued because our guests are so magical. We want to make sure we have, give them an opportunity if they want to be with us in the future. And also, Elise does a Flip Your Script Friday. She's been on a break, but I think she's coming back. And so she picks up great guests for that show, too. So I'll let you guys connect on that going forward to see if there's a fit there. Yes, too. I'll reach out as soon as we start up again. And may, it might be the new year. I think that that would be a good time to start at the beginning of the year. We'll start with our Flip Your Script Fridays again, so. That sounds great, great. Mm -hmm. I, I look forward to that. Definitely. Amazing. Well, thank you both again so much. Thank you everybody for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. We appreciate you uh, always. And we'll be back again, same time tomorrow, tomorrow with a couple of new amazing guests as well. But thank you again as so much on behalf of myself and Elise. Thank you for joining us, Sylvia. Thank you, everybody. Have a magical day. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.